Good evening and welcome to the Planning Commission meeting for September 28th, 7 p.m. At this moment, we'd like to say a moment of prayer or meditation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Thank you. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance will be led by Commissioner Lewis, Chair, uh, Vice Chair. Paulina, can you call roll? <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Good evening, uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, Commissioner Hang? Here. Commissioner Shelby? I'm sorry. <laughs> Commissioner Williams? Present. Uh, Commissioner Gutierrez? Here. Uh, Vice Chair Lewis? Here. Chair Becerra? Here. Tonight we have minutes from the regular meeting on August 24th, 2021, and the special meeting on September 8th, 2021. Does anyone have any changes to the minutes on August 24th or the special meeting on September 8th, 2021? Hearing none, the minutes of August 24th, 2021 and September 8th, 2021 are approved and submitted. Um, oral communications. Sorry. This is a time when any member of the public may, may speak to the commission on any matter within the scope of duties assigned to the commission relating to the non-agendized or consent calendar items. Other matters included in this agenda may be addressed when that item is under consideration. For all oral communications, the chairperson may impose reasonable limitations on public comments to assure an orderly and timely meeting. The Ralph M. Brown Act limits the Planning Commission and staff's ability to respond to public comments at this meeting. Thus, your comments may be agendized for a future meeting or referred to staff. The Commission may ask for clarifications if desired at this time. Does anyone have anything to speak on a non-agendized item this evening? So tonight we have three public hearings and one non-hearing item. We'll be hearing item number three first. Item number second, number two will be heard second. Paulina, who will, be, uh, who will represent the first staff report? Madam Chair, um, Joanne Burns, our planning manager, will be presenting the staff report. Good evening, Honorable Chair, members of the Planning Commission, also members of the public. The request is for a conditional use permit to allow 
here in wine sales for on-site conception and a hookah use in conjunction with a restaurant. The project site is located within the neighborhood high density residential zone in the downtown planning code. The subject tenant space was previously a restaurant within the Lake Center. It will uh, incorporate interior remodeling to take over the space as a new restaurant called Jasmine's Cafe. Jasmine's Cafe will be a Mediter will serve Mediterranean food. The Lakes Entertainment Center is comprised of a movie theater, re restaurants, and a parking lot with a parking structure. Across the Lakes Entertainment Center along Glendora Avenue is a mixture of restaurants and also retail and office spaces. Here is the Jasmine's Cafe's business operation plan. The hours of operation proposed is daily from 9 a.m. to 2 a.m. They will have two, eight employees total operating with two cooks, one dishwasher, three servers, and one hookah server. Here is the floor plan for the, for the tenant space. Hookah will strictly be served in the outdoor patio area. The restaurant, the restaurant will have a total of 21 tables, each with four seats. The hookah the hookah, the area that will be used for hookah lounge within, within the outdoor patio area is approximately 25 feet, and it's required to be 25 feet from any entrance or ex exits to any building. The kitchen and the kitchen storage room and restrooms are located towards the rear of the restaurant. Um, I, j I would like to point out that this, ever since the downtown plan was amend was adopted by the city council in 2016. This is the first application that the city has received and is processing for hookah use. Hookah use is only allowed in, um, in the city of West Covina in the downtown plan and code area, and it's not allowed outside of the downtown plan and code area. <coughs> Staff has incorporated additional operating conditions in addition to the city standards con standard conditions of approval in the draft resolution. Um, one being, as I mentioned earlier, requiring 25 feet from any building entrance. Hookah would be limited to customers ordering foods or drinks. Beer and wine and hookah is accessory to the full service restaurant. Staff would like to add two additional conditions of approval to the resolution if the Planning Commission approves this item tonight. Um, one, clarifying that cannabis use is not allowed. Um, cannabis businesses are not allowed in the city, so it would just be a condition of approval clarifying that um, cannabis products cannot be smoked in the hookah, and also um, pointing out that the applicants would have to comply to all health department regulations. Here are existing site photographs. The area that I'm point in, pointing um, with the red arrow is the subject tenant space. Um, it's this yellow um, colored tenant space building right along here. And the outdoor patio area is the area that in is enclosed by the back railing. There is a uh, restaurants along the side across the walkway that have that that currently have outdoor dining those restaurants are although that outdoor dining area is approximately 35 feet from where the rail this railing is so it would comply with all health department standards regarding being 25 feet away from from other smoking being 25 feet away from other 
um, restaurants with outdoor dining. Staff is able to support um, and make all the findings. With this, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission approve the conditional use permit and adopt resolution number 21-6099. If the Planning Commission has any questions, I am available to answer. The applicant is also here today. Thank you for the staff report. Does the Planning Commission have any questions for staff? Commissioner Gutierrez? Yes. Um, <clears throat> the patio will be used for uh, hookah as well? Yes. Okay. And is there an age limit in who could uh, smoke hookah? Or? 21. Okay. It's the same as smoking cigarettes. Great. And then um, to access, to have dinner or to have uh, food there, how old do you have to be? There is oh, no there's age no age limitation. There? There's no age limitation to eat in their restaurant. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Williams. No comments. Commissioner Hang. Not at this moment. Thank you. Vice Chair Lewis. I was just going to ask regarding um, regarding outdoor patios where smoking is allowed in in the city limits. Do we have anything? Um, like that right now not in the city not in the city's municipal code. So, so this would be the this would be the one exception in the entire city for that Yes. I have no further questions so I, I'm a little bit familiar with hookah but not so I know that there are what is it tobacco that is being smoked or I, I believe there were fruits or I'm not if you can familiarize us with what exactly, I don't know if anyone else here is familiar with it. The applicants would be able to answer that question and describe the, the, the use of hookah. Okay, we'll ask the applicant. Um, now we'll hear some testimony from the applicant if you'd like to come forward. Good evening, my name is Shadi. I'll be the owner of Jasmine Cafe. Currently, I have a Jasmine Cafe in Pomona too, restaurant, and that will be second location. Uh, to answer your question about the tobacco, it's a flavored tobacco. It's actually put in a bowl, and that's it. There's no any other drugs or anything. Just You have to be 21 to smoke it, and it's a flavored tobacco. Any other question? So we'll start with Commissioner Gutierrez. Do you have any questions for him? Uh, right, right now, no. Commissioner Williams, no questions. Commissioner Hang, no questions. Thank you. Vice Chair Lewis, there are no other questions. Is there anything that you would like to add? In I mean, by us adding the hookah and the beer and wine will increase our sales, and will help us will help that little bit the economy was for us and the other people like the pizza place, the ice cream place, and bring more traffic to the shopping center by us making that. And uh, instead, and there's a hookah in other cities like Glendora, Pomona, and I don't see why people need to, to drive from Moscovina to other city and make it convenient for them. So that's what we're trying to do right now. And that'd be all. Right. Anything else? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we will be opening public hearing. And we'll be hearing for those from those in favor of the project. So that was Shadi. We just heard from, correct? Yes. Donald Lamb. Madam Chair, I believe that's for item number two. Uh, two for Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. So I don't think we have any that are here to speak. Are any, anyone here to speak um, against the pro, the the, um, the hookah lounge? Okay.
So this time we'll take, discuss it among the commission. So is, does anyone have any, any additional questions on this or? Uh, yeah, one question. Um, what kind of, uh, maybe for the applicant, but what kind of food will be served at the, at the restaurant? Mediterranean food. Would that be for the? Sorry, Commissioner Gutierrez, it's Mediterranean food. Men okay. So it'll be full on dinner dishes, not just appetizers or anything like that? That's correct. It's going to be a full service restaurant. Okay. I believe that is required in order to get the permit for the wine and beer. That's correct. Okay. And there's there, uh, sorry, one more question. Um, is there any uh, lighting, lighting requirements and, and how dark the place could be? Because I know like in Anaheim, they have lighting restrictions to make sure it doesn't turn into kind of like a nightclub because of alcohol and, and everything being served there? The city, the city does not have any lighting restrictions beyond that re that's required by the building code. Mm -hmm. However, the Planning Commission would like to incorporate conditions of approval to address any lighting concerns, then you are welcome to do so. Okay, great. Yeah, because I know the, I know City of Anaheim, sometimes they put a, uh, Different, different things in a conditional use permit that says it can be too dark to, uh, to, prevent, some, it, to prevent it from turning into like a nightclub or something. And then my last question will be is there will there be any music uh, or live music or music playing or, or so forth? The application does not include any live music. Okay. That requires a separate um, entitlement. Okay, so no music at all will be allowed? Um, they can play the um, radio, but not okay. live entertainment. Okay, great. Well, this seems pretty simple. Did anyone like to motion? I'll motion to approve. Do we have a second? I'll second that. I have a motion by Becerra, seconded by uh, Commissioner Hang. Um, motion to approve resolution 21-6099. Uh, Commissioner Williams? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Gutierrez? Abstain. Uh, Commissioner Hang? Aye. C uh, Vice Chair Lewis? And Chair Becerra. Aye. Motion passes. Final action on this matter will be taken at the public hearing before the City Council on a date to be determined. Paulina, who will present the next item? Um, Madam Chair, um, sorry. Um, Joyce uh, Parker Bolinski, our planning consultant, will present the staff report. Yes. Good evening. Uh, Chair Becerra, members of the Planning Commission, I am um, assisting the city on this project. Uh, my name is Joyce Parker Bozolinski. The item before you is uh, consideration of an Amazon parcel delivery station. And good. there are um, several entitlements requested for the project. Um, one is a general plan amendment, a zone change, a precise plan, a tree, tree removal permit, a tentative parcel map, and a development agreement. And accompanying the, all of those entitlements is a mitigated uh, neg deck that was prepared for the project. 
location. Um, the aerial shows the location. It is uh, currently addressed as 1211 East Badillo Street. As part of the application, the applicant wishes to change the address to 1200 uh, East San Bernardino Road. The aerial uh, shows the surrounding land uses. Uh, directly to the north there are residential units in the city of Covina. To the uh, west are commercial and industrial uses in the city of Covina. To the south, across from Badillo, is single family homes that are in uh, West Covina. And to directly to the east is the residential units in the uh, Lark Ellen Village, also in the city of West Covina. The two photos show the existing um, uh, elevations as it's being used by Faith Community Church, or was being used by Faith Community Church. The um, the parcel is currently, or actually I think the um, Faith Community Church has, has vacated the parcel, but was currently used for, by Faith Community Church. It is a 21.22 uh, acre site, and the proposal is to repurpose the existing building. Uh, the this existing building is uh, 177 uh, 1,440 square feet in size, and so the uh, delivery station will utilize that building as well as the adjacent parking uh, lot. In the parking lot, there are 811 parking spaces, 185 passenger vehicles, and uh, 626 delivery vans. The proposal includes new lighting standards uh, throughout the parking lot. Um, they are proposed at 25 feet in height, and uh, along all of the property lines, the foot candle, uh, they all have uh, what's called house shields, which prevents the light from projecting back onto the adjacent property. And um, consistent with the city's code, the foot candles at the Lark Ellen um, property line, Lark, Lark Ellen Village property line would be 0.2 foot candle, or I'm sorry, 0 0.5 uh, foot candles. And that is what is required uh, by code adjacent to residential uses. Also, um, the code requires a six foot uh, minimum landscape planner uh, adjacent to residential uses, and there is an existing one out there that will remain. There is some uh, tall landscaping uh, that um, is mainly on the Lark Ellen uh, Village property, but some are on this property as well. And the applicant is also proposing to add additional uh, screen landscaping to fill in any gaps uh, that exist. The, uh, there will be 230 uh, trees. That includes both the existing ones and new trees. The proposal is to remove all of the high water trees, like the palm trees, and, and uh, replace those with low water trees. In terms of fencing and walls, there is an existing uh, wall on the east property line um, abutting uh, Lark Ellen uh, village and other than that the applicant is not proposing to uh, fence the exterior of the property the only fencing would be uh, around the employee parking lot which this is this area directly east that is not showing up okay there we go okay so um so it's directly east, this is the employee parking lot, so it will be fenced. And then uh, there will be uh, two 12-foot high walls. Uh, there will be screen sound walls adjacent to the loading dock areas. And that would be in this area here, um, facing Badillo, and then a smaller wall um, to the north, San Bernardino. In terms of how the facility will be operated, it is a parcel delivery station that will be operated uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. There are three types of employees. There are Amazon employees, and those are the ones that will be uh, parking in this uh, parking lot, the employee parking lot. These are the employees that will sort the packages at night, uh, generally. Um, and get them ready to be loaded into the vans the following day. So these employees enter off of uh, 
San Bernardino Road. Um, their only entrance into their employee parking lot is uh, right here where my cursor is showing. So um, they would come off of San Bernardino Road and then enter the, the parking lot there. There are also going to be um, approximately 14 tr uh, tr uh, tractor trailers uh, used in the facility. They, those will um, arrive and depart at various times during the day. Uh, during the day, uh, there will be uh, about four that will come during the day, and most of the trucks will come in the evening uh, after 7 o'clock and uh, make their arrivals. And all of the trucks will use San Bernardino Road. San Bernardino Road is the only uh, street that is a designated truck route, so they have to come off of Azusa and um, approach the uh, site from the east. And um, the applicant is proposing to install a new parking, uh, I'm sorry, a new traffic signal. And that traffic signal uh, would be right at Cutter Way. And so the existing driveway um, on the site would be moved to the east so that it aligns with uh, Cutter Way. And then it would also, uh, the parking, uh, the traffic light would also be there. And when the traffic light goes in, they'll also add a uh, left turn lane when that left-hand lane is installed, um, the parking spaces, the existing parking spaces that are in front of the facility on San Bernardino Road would need to be removed to uh, provide for that widening of the, of the area. The uh, purple areas uh, show where the vans will be parked. Um, there'll be 142 vans and uh, they will, when the uh, drivers arrive, they will arrive uh, starting around 9 o'clock, about or, uh, slightly earlier, to um, get ready to um, leave for the day. And they would park over in the, uh, this, oops, sorry, I'm using one, uh, south, um, southwest parking lot and then walk over to their vans, and then they would get in their vans and drive over to this area uh, where you, you see it's called the van staging area, and they will stage there until they're ready to enter the facility. They will enter the facility uh, to the south. There will be new um, overhead doors, and they will enter this facility, and they will be loaded inside of the um, building. The uh, vans, uh, the drivers of the vans will approach the site uh, from Badia, or they can approach from one driveway, the easterly most driveway on San Bernardino Road. Uh, when the vans leave, they will be inside the building and they will be leaving via this dedicated um, driveway. Um, it's a new driveway and uh, they'll be able to turn right or left onto San Bernardino Road. And um, the next group of workers, um, they're not really employees, but they're called flex drivers. And these are drivers that um, deliver Amazon packages in their own individual uh, vehicles. They arrive after, in the, in the afternoon around 4.30 and they will be the only uh, um, traffic that will um, evolve uh, some activity during the peak hours. They can also approach the site um, on any of the driveways on Badillo or uh, the easterly most driveway on San Bernardino Road. But when they exit, after they have loaded their vehicles and they exit, they would exit on uh, to uh, San Bernardino Road uh, out of the easterly most driveway. The, uh, there is a peak season, and that generally runs from uh, Thanksgiving to Christmas, and it is expected that the number of uh, long-haul trucks or trailer, uh, tractor-trailer trucks will double in size from 14 to 28, and that uh, the same for the delivery vans. They will, uh, delivery, uh, will do double in size, and then they would uh, just have um, add additional shifts during the day um, for distribution of the packages. See, I think I covered. Let's go back. So this um, orange area shows the path of the trucks that will be accessing the site. As you can see, they're coming off of San Bernardino Road and, and um, ending up back here at the loading dock. 
And then the green shows the path of exit of the vans and the flex drivers. Um, the green at, at this particular area down here um, is the flex drivers because the van drivers will be uh, picking up their vehicles which are parked in the parking lot and then moving into the building. Some uh, conceptual renderings. Uh, this rendering uh, will give you a view of the employee parking lot. This is the employee parking lot here. And you can see off in the distance the uh, trucks and then the one of the 12 foot high walls. You can't see directly, uh, have a, a good uh, front shot of this, but this paved area here is the uh, new road in which the vans will exit onto San Bernardino Road. This slide is from the southwest. This is from Badillo. It shows, uh, it has a good uh, representation of the loading dock and the 12 foot high walls over here in this area. And this on the southeast perspective shows where the vans will be. Um, this is the staging area for the vans. And uh, this is east of the property. Once the vans uh, are called into the building, they would enter uh, on the south side th uh, through this area where there will be new overhead doors that uh, they will utilize. In addition uh, to the precise plan, um, there is a tree removal permit to remove uh, three significant trees. The city uh, considers a significant tree, um, any tree that's over 12 inches, um, if it's in the front or side uh, setback, and so these three ficus trees are in the front setback, and the reason they need to be removed is the, the existing driveway has to be uh, moved to the east to align with Cutter Way. The three trees, uh, the views are shown, uh, those are the same three trees, uh, just a different view, one looking east from San Bernardino Road and one looking west. The trees are 24 inches, 24 and a half inches, and 29 and a half inches. The additional request includes a uh, general plan amendment, and that request is to change the land use designation from civic public uh, institutional, which is the uh, land use designation uh, that was placed for the Faith Community Church. And the request is to change that to industrial to accommodate the delivery station. The zone change would change uh, the current zoning from SP or specific plan uh, dash 11. Uh, Faith Community Church to Manufacturing or M1. There's also a tentative parcel map uh, to combine two uh, parcels or two lots into one uh, on the site. Traffic impacts, um, we do have the city's traffic uh, consultant here, Jana Robbins, uh, to answer any questions and then also the, the uh, CEQA um, expert is here who uh, prepared the mitigated neg deck. So this is just a broad overview, but the project trip generation is uh, 914 daily trips. Uh, when the counts were taken, the new counts were taken in 2021, they were compared to the 2019 counts because of uh, those counts were pre-COVID and so um, the city wanted to make sure that uh, they, were, they accurately reflected the uh, counts. Um, most of the, because most of the trips are outside of the typical peak hour, when the vans uh, start leaving the facility, uh, it's, it's generally they'll start leaving about 10 o'clock. And so that is outside of the rush hour uh, uh, or peak hour. Um, and thus there was no uh, significant traffic impact, uh, impacts from the project. There is a development agreement. Um, as part of the um, application, the development agreement calls for the applicant uh, to uh, pay the city a total of four million uh, in total sales tax. A sales tax will pay it off, paid over uh, several um, payments over a, a period of time, but the total would be $4 million. It's considered a community benefit payment uh, since the facility w is not a, um, uh, would not generate sales tax. In addition, because this project does not um, have a conditional use permit, um, the uh, 
the conditions relative to the use itself are being placed in the development agreement. And these include an annual driveway count to monitor the number of vehicles uh, entering and ex exiting the site. And that is to ensure that um, if the facility um, uh, grows in any way that they would, and more trucks are, are generated or more vans are generated, um, they would then be required to come back to the city and amend the uh, development agreement and then um, we would also do additional CEQA analysis to make sure that the traffic impacts and the other noise or other impacts like noise would uh, remain insignificant. There, um, there would be a 24-hour complaint hotline that would be maintained by Amazon. Uh, there would be um, there was some concern as we uh, went through the CEQA process about backup alarms, both the vans and the uh, long haul trucks or the tractor trailer trucks have backup alarms. And so there is a condition that says that if the uh, backup alarms exceed the OSHA requirements, then they would, um, Amazon has agreed to work with the city to make some operational changes to minimize the sound from the backup uh, alarms. Another condition is that the left turn pocket on San Bernardino Road uh, would not have more than one truck, and that is to keep the trucks from um, either stopping in uh, San Bernardino Road in one of the travel lanes or uh, partially um, hanging out or sticking in the um, one of the travel lanes. And so there's a condition that uh, the maximum um, trailer tractor waiting at any one time is one they expect Amazon does expect that uh, uh, given their uh, the way the trucks will be um, spaced out and arrive uh, they they don't anticipate any problem with that and there will be no public pickup of packages allowed at the site uh, another condition is that all uh, individual consultants contractors and self-employed drivers must obtain a West Covina business license. And then finally, the um, applicant has agreed to uh, good faith, in good faith to um, purchase supplies and services from the city of West Covina, uh, local uh, businesses, based businesses, and uh, request that their consultants and contractors to patronize the local businesses in, in, the, in the community. The environmental review, uh, there was, as I mentioned, a mitigated neg negative declaration prepared for the project. It was circulated uh, for public comment uh, July 13th, 2021 through August the 11th, 2021. Comments were received from the California Department of Transportation, the City of Covina, uh, Wood, Lane, Wood Lane Village Homeowners Association, the Teamsters Local Union, and six concerned individuals. All of those letters uh, were responded to and were included in the response to comment document, which was distributed as part of the Planning Commission packet. The environmental work was done by uh, Somas, uh, the city's environmental consultant. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jim Hunter, who is a principal with uh, Somas, to uh, give a brief PowerPoint on the uh, mitigated egg deck. Good evening, commissioners, staff, and other interested folks. Um, my comments tonight will focus on the uh, content of the environmental document that was prepared on the proposed project. Um, California Environmental Quality Act requires that when a proposed project uh, uh, entails a discretionary action by a lead agency, city in this case, that an environmental review um, is conducted. 
and in this case, uh, the environment, in any case, the environmental review purpose, sole purpose is to disclose the potential impacts of the proposed project. Uh, secondly, it identifies uh, feasible mitigation measures to reduce those impacts. In this case, an initial study, mitigated negative declaration was, a, was prepared and the, uh, reviewed with city staff and agreed that that was the appropriate CEQA document for the proposed project. Uh, the slide notes that the city of West Covina is the lead agency. Um, that is standard where uh, any project that is required for a CEQA review has a agency that is in front of it. In, that case, in this case, it is the uh, city of West Covina. Um, issues analyzed in the ISMND. Um, the CEQA checklist included 20 topical areas. All 20 of these were addressed in the initial study, mitigated negative declaration. Um, aesthetics, agricultural and forestry, air quality, biological resources, cultural resources, energy, geology and soils, greenhouse gas emissions, hazards and hazardous materials, hydrology and water quality, land use and planning, mineral resources, noise, population and housing, public services, recreation, transportation, tribal cultural resources, utilities and service systems, and wildfire. Uh, the next few slides will focus on the summary of the findings and of the uh, 20 topics, you can see that several re re the impacts analysis resulted in no impacts or less than significant impacts. Um, there's 15 of the 20, as a matter of fact, that uh, had that conclusion. Um, you'll see on this slide that there's a, um, an RR in parentheses next to a couple of the topics. That means there's regulatory requirements that apply to those topics. And those are, um, those are requirements that apply to any project that is being evaluated um, under CEQA. And, and, and even projects that, uh, that are, are, are um, below a certain threshold, the city and the county and the state have regulatory requirements that apply to land development. So that's what I just wanted to make sure everyone understood that. This next slide, we actually get into those um, topics that significant impacts were identified for and that mitigation measures were proposed to reduce those impacts. Uh, the first one was biological resources. Um, under this, there was one regulatory requirement and one mitigation measure. Um, the mitigation measure Bio 1 requires site preparation and construction activities to be scheduled outside bird nesting and breeding season. Typically, that's March 1st through um, August 15th of each year. If during nesting season, um, mitigation requires a nesting bird survey within 200 feet of, disturb of the disturbance area, a temporary buffer of 200 feet around the nest site if one is discovered, and that no clearing or construction would occur within a temporary fenced area until the juveniles have, have fledged from the nest. Um, the next uh, significant impact was under cultural resources and this is, um, this is an, what I like to call an if-then kind of a, a, of a mitigation measure. It calls for a qualified archaeologist to monitor ground-disturbing activities in native soil and divert excavation activities in the vicinity of a find in the event of discovery of an archaeological or historic resource. Um, geology and soils. MMG01 requires compliance with the recommendations in the geotechnical study that's com been completed by Kleinfelder for the proposed project and additional future design level geotechnical investigations of the project site. MMG02 requires if grading activities encounter unknown paleontological resources, ground disturbing activities will cease. A qualified paleontologists will examine the materials and recommend a course of action to protect, recover, or salvage what was found. Under the topic of hazards and hazardous materials, MM has one requires additional soil vapor sampling to verify current vapor levels compared to appropriate risk-based screening levels. If above screening levels, other action will be developed in consultation with the appropriate agencies. Under the topic of transportation, there's a, there's a few here. Um, transportation number one requires a new traffic signal at the intersection of Cutter Way and project driveway number seven. Transportation number two requires vegetation along the driveways on Badillo Street. 
to um, maintain a clear line of sight of existing vehicles. Transportation number three requires new red curbs along Badillo Street to provide a clear line of sight of existing vehicles. Transportation number four requires a signal and striping plan to accommodate left turn lanes and pockets on both approaches of San Bernardino Road at Cutter Way. Transportation number five requires installation of a, two, I believe this is a typo, it should be two-way left turn lane along the entire project east of Cutter Way. Transportation number six requires the amount of red curb on San Bernardino Road to be shown on all plans. The amount of red curb will be determined by the applicant's engineer. Transportation number seven requires installation of signs associated with the conceptual striping plan. And those are the findings and a general summary of the environmental document. So the next slide discusses community outreach and notices. Uh, there was a neighborhood meeting held uh, August the 30th, uh, 2021. It was a uh, webinar uh, due, the, due to the pandemic and uh, the fact that it, it could not meet in purpose. It was held by the developer. Uh, the developer also did additional outreach. Uh, they met with people in person, uh, also uh, answered questions via email and they did a neighborhood walk in the neighborhood south of Badil and uh, knocked on doors and talked to uh, the residents there. In terms of the legal noticing uh, that was um, distributed, uh, one would be the CEQA that uh, was noticed uh, for the comment period. It was noticed on July 13, uh, indicating that the comment period, uh, CEQA comment period ended on August the 11th. And then, of course, the public hearing notice uh, for the hearing tonight, that was sent out on September the 16th. And with that, uh, staff is uh, recommending that the Planning Commission adopt the resolutions you have uh, in your packet, resolutions number 21-6093 through 21-6098. Uh, they would uh, recommend to the City Council um, approval of the precise plan, the tree removal permit, the tentative parcel map, the general plan amendment, zone change, and development agreement. Generally, the Planning Commission would be the final decision um, making body on the precise plan and tree removal permit, but since there are legislative actions that need to go to the City Council, such as the general plan amendment, and zone change, and then also they are the final decision-making body on the development agreement. All of the um, permits will be forwarded to the City Council, and the Planning Commission uh, will act in the role of a recommending body in this case. That concludes staff uh, presentation, and we are available uh, for questions. Thank you for the staff report. Does the Planning Commission have any questions? or staff? Commissioner Gutierrez? Commissioner Williams? Not at this time. Commissioner Hang? Vice Chair Lewis? Not at this time. At this time, we'll open public hearing and we'll hear fr a testimony from the applicant.
if you don't mind that I remove my mask. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, members of the commission. I'm sorry, Chair Becerra and members of the commission, and thank you and congratulate all of you new members. It's fantastic that four of you have joined your commission. It is an extraordinary honor to be a planning commissioner for a city. My background is uh, much like yours. I come from government. I spent 36 years as either a community development director or a city manager in various cities. So when I became quite old, I decided I'd be a consultant and help communicate between cities and applicants. So in this case, I am the communicator between Amazon and the buyer, your Greenlaw Partners. And I've represented Greenlaw Partners for the last 10 years. So I know them quite well, very reputable firm. And that's why I'm here tonight to talk about what they're doing. Now, I had a lengthy presentation to make, and the staff went and covered everything. So now I'm sitting here looking at, well, I'd like to then just cover the areas that I think are probably most important that maybe they didn't and not take up too much of your time tonight. To start with, uh, why, let's, um, let's see if we can get the slides going. Which way? Your way? Well, it, it works. I tried it before. Yeah, it works. Cool. Yeah, we'll, we'll just do this. Well, if we can start with slide two, how's that? Back up just one. That is slide three. So anyway, while they're doing that, uh, who we are. The, the developer in this case is Greenlaw Partners. Greenlaw Partners is based in Orange County. Uh, they have been around for over 15 years. Developers and owners of large uh, commercial office complexes, retail, in a particular right now, they represent Amazon. Amazon would be the tenant in this particular building. Uh, Greenlaw has worked with Amazon on 20 different other sites. I've worked with them on five sites. So why did they come to West Covina? West Covina has a very positive image. Amazon and Greenlaw Partners looked at the city and said, there is a demand in this city for additional services to the Amazon customers. So when Amazon looked at its profile as far as where their customer trade area was, they felt that West Covina, Covina in this uh, central area, has a greater need for additional delivery than currently exists. The, the demand dramatically increased during the COVID shutdown. So after talking to various cities and looking at your city's website, you're a very positive city. You have a very strong economic development program. You want more jobs. You want more revenue to the city. Amazon was impressed. Greenlaw Partners was impressed. Met your city staff, even more impressed. And we'd like to again thank Colleen, um, Paulina, uh, Joanne, Joyce, who worked on the project, City Manager Carmony. They all did a great job. We've worked on this project for almost two years with your city. So what you're seeing tonight is the culmination of two long years where the work of adjusting, modifying, and revising this project to where we think it fits perfect for your city and would bring you as many positive aspects as possible and very few, if any, negative aspects. So if we can go to slide three. Or do you want me to try? Okay, technology. So why this particular piece of property? This property has a long history. It was built as an industrial building. It is an industrial building. It's concrete tilt-up type construction. It fronted onto San Bernardino Road when it was built, and it was first occupied by Honeywell Corporation. Honeywell manufactured electronics in the aerospace industry. Today, you probably know them on your house. Your thermostat on the wall is a Honeywell thermostat. With uh, the years that went by, Honeywell then moved from the property. The property was then occupied by Hughes Electronics. 
Hughes uh, was also an aerospace manufacturer, and they either started and created either Dish Network or Direct TV, but they were the creators of the Dish satellite system. But as time went by, somewhere in the late 90s, early 2000s, industry moved out of this building, left it. It was basically an empty, deserted building. It was purchased by Faith Community Church. Faith Church uh, decided it met their needs. Very uh, small building to size ratio, huge parking area. So Faith came to the city, and the city changed the zoning and the general plan from industrial and manufacturing M1 to what we call a specific plan in which the church was approved to have a church, a preschool, and the layout that you see today. So it was a very site-specific zoning that only allows churches. In fact, what's really funny is in the zoning code, we go back to look at it. It also allows a mausoleum and burial in the site. But we won't mention that at this point in time. But uh, the church has been there for many years. The church has grown. They've enjoyed the, uh, the home in West Covina. They have many members here. In fact, last Easter... Easter Sunday, in a 24-hour period, over 8,000 members of the congregation passed through this property. So if you think 140-some vans is a lot, try 8,000 on Easter Sunday. That's the level of traffic that's been passing through here as this church has been so successful. They do, however, wish to sell, move on to building smaller neighborhood-type churches. They still will be in your community, your same uh, congregation members, they love West Covina, so they will be around, but they need to downsize. So we're simply asking, as the applicant, to change the property back to its original general plan, its original zoning, and repurpose it back to what it was built as, an industrial building. Now, why the 1211 East Badillo address versus San Bernardino? When the church bought the property, they didn't like the entry out on San Bernardino and created the entry on the backside on Badillo. So that was an addition to the building, so the address was actually switched from 1200 West San Bernardino Road to the 1211 Badillo address. More neighborhood-oriented, better for dropping off children for the school. So that was the occasion. We're proposing to go back to what it originally was again, because the building does front on San Bernardino Road. And also then for mapping purposes, when vehicles come to the site, we want them to have a San Bernardino Road address since Badillo is not a truck route. And what is a truck route? A truck route in the state of California, and it's in state law, is where a truck that's greater than 12,000 pounds in delivering goods must stay on a truck route unless it has a, de a delivery document called a bill of lading. So without that, the trucks that pass through this area of the city must go east and west, west and east on San Bernardino Road. That is the designated truck route in this area. So is Azusa. So just like the, de um, the Home Depot east of this site, who has a truck dock very similarly. Trucks come from either the 10 freeway or the 210. Azusa north and south is the truck route. East and west is San Bernardino Road. So logically, that's why it's been, uh, been designed as such. The new driveway uh, entry point on the east, I'm sorry, the west side of the property, the signal is being placed there to make it a safer turn into the property. The traffic study, though, actually did not require the signal for the amount of traffic that's increasing, which is not significant, it required it for safety purposes because there was a feeling that with trucks making a left turn only one at a time and at one about every hour, that it'd be better and safer to have four-way dedicated left turn. And we worked with the city of Covina as well, and they really wanted the signal there. So that's why the additional signal, not based on an increase in traffic volumes. Jobs, uh, we feel, are important to your community. You're looking for jobs. You're looking for sales tax. So I am going to simply move forward a little bit and talk about a delivery station. So any chance you can find slide number six? Sorry. Okay. Oh, uh, that's good. Uh-oh. You know what? Just um, we'll leave it right there. So what is a parcel delivery station? This is very new. Amazon has, for years, been using Federal Express, FedEx, United Parcel Services, and the USPS to deliver packages. But the demand has grown so much that they feel that they can enter the marketplace and they can more efficiently deliver their own products. So you see many of the Amazon vans in your community already. So people say this facility would add more traffic. If you think about that for a minute, the vans already exist. 
They're already passing through your community. They're already going to businesses and homes. The difference is that the source, the location where they're coming from, this will be a new point in which they can dispatch from here. More efficient, serve your city better. But otherwise, it's the same vehicle that's passing through. But these vehicles in your city now will be an expansion for the company, and these will represent new jobs. So Amazon will be hiring locally drivers of vans and the associates who work inside the warehouse. So the parcel delivery warehouse or parcel delivery station, what is it? Picture your United States post office in your neighborhoods. At a post office, what do they have? The truck comes in in the middle of the night, delivers the packages and the mail, sorted in the morning time by the mail carrier. Mail carrier puts it in their truck or, and takes it out and delivers to all the homes. In this case, the same single type trailer trucks deliver the packages in the night from a fulfillment center. So we don't want anyone to confuse this with an Amazon fulfillment center. Those are the big mega warehouses you see out off of uh, the 15 freeway and out in San Bernardino, the million square foot plus buildings. Those stay the same. The trucks come from there. But the little delivery station that this is, the packages come in all night long. They're sorted by a night crew by the associates. The night crew uh, puts them by zip code and neighborhood into pouches. They're lined up. And then in the daytime, that's when the drivers show up. So the drivers don't even come to this property until 930 in the morning. We don't want them going out in the peak periods, which are 7 to 9 a.m., or 4 to 6 p.m. That's when your traffic from commuters are occurring. So these drivers are showing up around 9 to 9.30. They are called each day by the demand that's needed. So over the nighttime, when the packages come in, Amazon knows about how many drivers they need for the next day. So the call goes out, and in the next morning shift, that many drivers show up, park their car, check out the van, and go in and get in line and stage, and they go into the building. Vans do not leave this site for delivery until 10 a.m. So no van's going to leave this property. No other truck or vehicle leaves during that time frame. The vans leave starting at 10. And you can see on, if you go to slide number eight, the site plan, somebody can find that. There we go. Um, no, the new site. There we go. Let's just keep that one on the screen. It's easiest. If you can see to the right side or the east side of the building, which looks like vans parked in clusters, the delivery vans or the delivery service providers, uh, drivers, line up there first. So if there are enough needed, they'll fill up the first cluster. And if more needed, they'll fill up the second. Starting about 9.30 or so, the first group is led inside the building. And then at that point, those drivers have a window of 20 to 30 minutes to take and load their own vans. They load. They have a full um, dispatch system in which they know who's going what and where. And exactly 20 to 30 minutes, the groups are released out onto San Bernardino Road. They'll either turn right going east or left going west, and they're dispersed. Those vans stay out 9 to 10 hours a day. They do not start returning to the site until in the evening. So when they start returning, they randomly come one at a time, most will return along Badillo. Some may return on San Bernardino Road. But they'll work their way back to the parking lot, park their van. The driver gets in their car and goes home. But since this is a seven-day-a-week operation, many of those drivers will only be working a four-day shift. So there are overlaps in drivers and vehicles. Most drivers are assigned to their own van. Therefore, you have far more vans than are used in a given day because they're used by different drivers at different times. So that's a parcel delivery station, how it works. It's working very successfully in many other cities in Southern California. Uh, we are having a good experience. In fact, in those cities, I have not heard of complaints. I have not heard of anything to do with noise, traffic, and the like. Uh, but uh, we'll hear and we'll continue on. A little bit more about the types of vehicles. Again, it overlaps a little bit with the staff. But in this site plan, Joyce had shown you the upper left corner where that parking lot exists and the black line, which is the 12-foot wall. So why is that wall there? The consultants did the noise study, and the noise study determined that there would be an insignificant, almost not perceptible levels of noise off this property. That meant south across Badillo, 
or east into the Lark Ellen apartment complex. That wall is not required by the noise study. That wall has been volunteered by the developer, Green Law Partners, because we want to be absolutely certain that those trucks that come in at nighttime are not seen or heard. So any truck that comes in at night to deliver the packages comes in from the signal off of San Bernardino Road, drives down that driveway, is hidden behind the 12-foot wall. Now, truck trailers are generally 13 feet high. So no one to the south across Badillo would see headlights, would hear the truck, and then that same truck dock area has a 12-foot wall on its other side. So the trucks are isolated in there. They come and they go. They will not be seen or heard by anyone in a residence. The buildings to the west of here are all industrial in the city of Covina. So we isolated it intentionally. The employees who work in this facility most work in the night shift. And they're in that same parking area, so that way they also have a very secure environment because many of these are individuals who have to go to their cars at 1, 2 in the morning uh, to leave or may arrive. So that is the secure area, and there's also rideshare drop-off and pickup, uh, outdoor uh, walking area. And just inside, there's a very lavish floor plan that has break room, um, rest areas, restrooms, and the like where the employees work. So... It's a very nice facility the way it's uh, outlined, but that is the existing building. There's not a single additional square foot being added to that building. The site is exactly the same. What we are really doing, and you summarize all of this down into a simple request, is that we're requesting that when the church moves out, Amazon moves in, the inside of the building is remodeled, the outside is greatly improved, painted, re-landscaped, and they be allowed to operate. It's not any worldly great impact. It shouldn't affect anybody, but it should have very positive effects for the community in regard to more jobs and income and services. I need to skip all the other slides because the staff's already covered those at this point. So I guess I might as well just go towards the end. You can see, well, that's a good slide to look at if we can back up one. The architecture, that's the building that exists today. It's been repainted, remodeled. It will have new signing, upgraded landscape. So that, I think, will be a dramatic improvement for your city. I mean, this is You're attracting an Amazon building. Uh, most cities that we deal with out there look at this like I'm sure you do. This is the largest corporation in the United States, and they picked you over your competing cities in the neighborhood, and you know who they are. Um, you won. And we thank the staff for that, and we've been working hard with this. So if we can go uh, basically to the end, to slide number 13. I will spare going through all the other details. The benefits to the community, again, as we've mentioned, this should generate at least 250 new jobs for your community. We feel they are good-paying jobs. They start at a minimum of $15 an hour, which is almost double the uh, lowest level of minimum wage. This property currently is, on, uh, is exempt from property taxes. It's a church. When it converts over to this building, it will generate around $80,000 a year, every year, in new property tax the city is not currently receiving. Additionally, uh, the, sales tax, the sales tax replacement agreement that has been negotiated and discussed this project will be paying the city in lieu of generating sales tax because Amazon does not collect sales tax that's attributable to you. It goes on a statewide basis. So Amazon and Green Law Partners are proposing a sales tax development agreement that will pay the city $2 million in this coming year and $200,000 a year for the following 10 years to replace the sales tax that a sales tax generating business would have generated on this site. We've covered the community outreach. We've been very um, impressed in the community outreach. We had our online meeting, which I conducted. In the online meeting, I believe we had somewhere in the range of six to eight citizens who participated. Notices were sent out to everyone. Uh, It was a resident within 300 feet. So it was a very low turnout to the online, and those uh, who called in expressed a few questions, but nothing I would consider to be extreme criticism. We then walked, um, I can't pronounce the street, Legina, the 
First residential street south of Badia. Walked the entire block. Most people on the street either did not have an opinion, uh, listened, and that was it. There was one or two that maybe had questions. Some said, go away, don't bother us, no solicitors. But no significant opposition on the street, uh, no serious opinions. And we think, as most people see across Bedio, that uh, nothing will really change. It, it will be basically the same, and in fact, you probably have a lot less traffic on the weekends. So with that, I will summarize down to the very end. You have in front of you tonight a series of six different applications for review. The summary to this is that these are all applications tonight that we are asking you to recommend approval to your city council. Unfortunately, you don't have the ability to give the final approval tonight. I wish you could, but you make the recommendation to the city council. We'll be doing the same presentation to the city council then on October 16, 19. The general plan amendment, again, we request that you approve that. It goes from the current civic general plan designation back to industrial. We ask that you change the zoning, make that recommendation from Faith Church back to the M1. The precise plan is the development plan. We ask that you recommend that to the city council. We've spent a lot of time and money to enhance that property, improve it, and really make it something of value and something that you will be honored to have your name on to see in the community such a nice piece of property that's been remodeled and brought back to, to life again. There is a parcel map in that process. Uh, the parcel map is because there are two existing lots from years ago, and for some reason they still exist, and the building's even on top of it. Under current laws, you can't have a building over a property line. So the parcel map simply to eliminate that line and make it the one parcel that you see on the site plan. It's that simple. There's nothing else to the parcel map. The tree removal permit, it sounds really enormous. It's three trees. It's three trees where the cutter driveway is right now. Um, I'm sorry, next to the current driveway. To put the traffic signal in, that driveway off of San Bernardino has to be realigned slightly to line up with the uh, traffic signal. And because three of those trees there are over 12 inches in diameter, under your city codes, they have to have approval of the tree removal permit. So it's three trees that we're asking for that authority for you to approve tonight. And lastly, the development agreement, 2101. Um, that typically is something up to a city council. By law, a planning commission recommends, but a city council is the only one empowered to adopt because development agreements are adopted by ordinance like a zone change. So with all of that, we thank you very much. We think this is very compacted. It's been put together very well. Your staff's done an excellent job. All the environmental documentation that you saw was peer-reviewed by the city's environmental consultant, so it was prepared by one consultant. It was peer-reviewed and approved by uh, Somas, who just spoke. It was reviewed and approved by the city staff. It was presumably reviewed and approved by the city attorney. It's had multiple reviews, so your environmental documents before you tonight are fully adequate. They fully comply with the California Environmental Quality Act. We're comfortable with that as an applicant because we deal with this all the time. We feel your city did a great job. You have a great project in front of you tonight, and we really encourage and hope that you will support us and recommend approval. So thank you very much for all the time here tonight. I'm sorry I went on longer than probably needed, but uh, we just are very pleased to be here. So thank you. And may I answer questions now? Mr. Murray, correct? Pardon me? Mr. Murray. Murray is your last name? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm Donald oh, Lamb, L-A-M-M. -M. I was the one you called up in the earlier one. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. Yes. And <laughs> after the public comment period, if I could have the courtesy of being able to come back up and address any concerns, I'll take notes and I'll come back up and answer all the questions of anyone who speaks then. Well, at this time, we're going to ask the commission to, if they have any questions for you. We'll start with Commissioner Gutierrez. Uh, no, I don't, I don't have any uh questions but i do commend uh green law partners for their commitment and investment back into our community and the jobs and its commitment you're giving back to uh, the residents of west covina so thank you thank you very much Julian? yes i do have a question um i noticed in the presentation that there would be a total of 914 vehicles leaving the site yes 
and that it was pointed out during the season between Thanksgiving and Christmas that it would double. What would that amount of vehicles be? I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh. I'm sorry, Chair. Okay. For the season between Thanksgiving and Christmas, yeah. since the number of vehicles will be doubled, what would the amount of vehicles be during that time? <clears throat> Excuse me. The best answer is the number of vehicles are the same. More come and go. So there are more trucks that would do deliveries, pick up and deliveries. There would be more or greater shifts of the associates who work the nighttime. I can pull up in my notes what's in the environmental impact report or environmental mitigated negative declaration. I think it's a upwards of maybe a 20% increase in that five-week period between Thanksgiving and Christmas. It's an unknown is the problem. So it's hard for us to quantify because last year mm -hmm. we were in the full COVID shutdown and so many people were ordering. This year it's probably going to be a lower demand at Christmas because Amazon last year was declared an essential services business mm -hmm. and most retail stores had restrictions. So that number will go down. We will probably have a much better understanding this holiday. But all the numbers that you see and you've been given tonight for environmental planning purposes are the maximums. Okay. So when the business says we have X number of vans, X number of trips, it's up to on any given day it could be less. So those operating conditions that were referenced in the development agreement We'll set those caps at these numbers in the documents. So Amazon can go up to those. During the holiday in the development agreement, it's addressed that they can go over it slightly. And, and I can't quantify what that number is in my mind exactly. But in that four to five week period, yes, it's planned that there will be more. And that's without sitting down looking at the numbers to your immediate answer, if that helps. It does. One other question I have. At this particular location, is Amazon looking at using electric truck, uh, tractor trailers as well as electric vans? Uh, we'll start with the track and tra 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 truck and trailers. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the, the typical Amazon freight truck right now, they call a line haul truck, is the single cab, single trailer, and that's what they're using from all of the fulfillment centers in. I'm not aware of that changing at all in the near future. The delivery vans are all the two-axle Mercedes Sprinter, Ford, Aero, Star, whatever, and Dodge. Those are gas-powered. Amazon is moving towards electric. They are not ready to start and commit to full electric at this point. But Amazon is heavily invested in a new electric vehicle startup company called Rivian Automotive. Rivian is coming online this fall. It will be public that they are going to start building Amazon vans, vans for the public, SUVs, sport utility vehicles, and pickup trucks. So Amazon is gearing towards the future to move more into the electric van, delivery van business. They're not prepared yet on this site because this site does not have enough electric power that has been sent to the site to handle all of the charging stations. There are a significant number on the site plan in the employee parking lot right now, but probably in the next five years, there's going to be a greater shift in Amazon company-wide more towards electric. As far as the, uh, the freight trucks, I'm not aware yet that any of them are really viable on the, the highways for freight hauling. Kinsworth and Freightliner are the two major manufacturers of the cabs. And I know there are some that are in experimental stages, but I don't know beyond that. And Amazon has certain proprietary things that they don't tell a guy like me personally. But that's the best understanding. Their sustainability slide I had put up here, but um, they are making longer-term commitments that, uh, anyway, sorry, but long-term corporate commitments best they can on reducing greenhouse gases and Okay, their climate pledge, uh, their renewable energy by 2025, that's their goal, and that is electric. Uh, the shipments, um, 
zero carbon by 2030. So that gives you an idea of their goals corporate-wide, and that was the slide that they gave us as well to commit to. But uh, if you ask me, can it be conditioned as such right now? Not at this point in time. They, they can't accept that as a business operating condition. But the way their business is operated today, they still are, are under the threshold of any significant impacts on air quality, traffic, or noise, which are the big three. Um, because as, as big as this site looks, and it sounds really big and monstrous, it's not. There, there really is not a whole lot of traffic from this site. It has the appearance because of the parking. But as I mentioned, many of these vehicles are not used every day. It's like a large parking lot where each day drivers come in and take a few and go use them. But it's intimidating looking to some cities. This is the smallest uh, delivery station I've worked on. Most are double the size. And two that I worked on up in Bakersfield, they just welcomed the minute we walked in the door. I mean, it's jobs. And those were replacements for uh, Home Depots, Kmart, retail stores that had failed. Mm -hmm. So it's many cities out there just been pounding our door down. Palmdale, others. So I hope that helps. It does. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And there any others? Commissioner Hang. Actually, I do have one. Um, I'll try to speak louder. Can you hear better? Okay. I, I just wanted to see if you can help me explain in terms of the entryway and San Padidino. There are two, I believe. Can you, can you bring up that map again? And then if you can actually explain that portion. And also the third one is um, going out towards San um, Padillo. Is that correct? So can you explain like how much of a traffic well, it goes through there, and what type of uh, car that I, I know majority will be on the west side. Okay. Okay, use, using this site plan, let's start with San, San Bernardino Road. So east to west. Trucks would come from Azusa, westbound on San Bernardino Road, and the only point of entry is right at Cutter Way where the new traffic signal would be. So they'd turn left, go into the project, uh, back in, and then drive out and go right back out to Azusa, no other direction. They do not use the other two driveways on San Bernardino Road, the easterly one or the middle one. Now, what are these two used for? The middle one is an exit only as the vans come out of the building. It's a dedicated right out to the street. The vans either turn east and go to wherever or to the west. The easterly driveway is an auxiliary driveway for vans returning to the site if need be, as well as the four on Badillo. So it's a universal one, but the vans can also come in at the westerly side. So vans can come back eastbound to turn in here to go down and enter this area. They can come in this driveway and park here. So it depends upon where the van is parked and stored as to probably where the driver is going to re-enter the site. So it dispersed around the site completely by having the various driveways. So, so the green line toward the east side of the property, not necessarily that all the van's going to go directly off that location. You're saying it's, it's up here like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight entryway for the returning van. Is that? Yes, that's correct. All of the driveways can be used for the returning vans except the departure that's dedicated in the middle. But the vans also return randomly at the end of the day. So as a driver, if a driver comes from the west, it may turn in here immediately and park in this area or actually in here because most of the drivers park their cars here, but it might turn in here. I'm sorry, there is, it has to turn in here. There's a median break on Badillo. So the eastbound could turn left into the site, park here, could park in here, going the opposite direction again, entering here. What are these colors for? 
In reality, the colors were more generated for the engineers to look at the geometrics of how this would flow. This green line does not in any way mean that all vans coming back to the site go in here. They did this to show for fire department and other flow that it can flow this direction, and then after staging outside, they go in. Well, when they return, they don't go back through here. They return to the parking lot to their spaces. So it's a description showing a flow pattern here. Now, they can come in this driveway and flow up this direction if they wish. They can go into these drive aisles. So it has all the different uh, uses on the site for access. Again, on this side, all the employees park in this area that work in the building. So at nighttime, uh, after 10 o'clock, everything that's in the lavender color is shut down. It's locked down for the night. There's no one on this property that's going to be outside in any of this area after 10 o'clock at night. In fact, by 7, most of the vans will be back, but the last vans have to return by 10. It's shut down. The operation of the building, then, all doors are closed, and everybody is working inside sorting for the next day. So the sortation associates are parking strictly in this area. As the trucks come in in the night, they offload, and then they sort. They line them up inside on racks, and in the morning... At 9.30, when the van drivers show up, then as they're released to come in the building, they don't depart from this property until 10 a.m. So no van leaves until 10 in the morning. They have to be back by 10 at night. And the associates that work here all come and go through this driveway, and they have this secure, protected area. What about the long-haul trucks? Where do they enter? The long-haul trucks, the large trucks? Right. The, you see the red path are the long-haul trucks only. So they have to come from Azusa down San Bernardino, left turn in, that's why we have the new signal. They drive down into here, they back to the dock. After the offload, they leave. So that's why the dock has the 12-foot wall all along here that completely will block their view from anybody south of Badillo, block their view, block the sound. There's another 12-foot wall on that side of the dock that holds sound in from any other direction. So it's a very isolated, walled-in dock. It has, I think it's a total of eight docks one of those is primarily for the truck that picks up recycled materials, but it doesn't mean they're going to be full all the time. There could be one in there. There could be a second one come and go. But eight docks is not huge for an industrial building of this size. There currently exist three docks that are there from the old industrial days. This is the actual loading dock to that building. The building, the property topography drops off, for these are raised docks in the building right now in this area. The church, again closed off the front, no longer wanted the view from San Bernardino Road, and created this entry with the big steps back in here and the children's play area here. Well, the entry will be sealed. This will no longer be the case. The entry will be in the front uh, as far as the aesthetics go, but the actual doors are right here in this area. So that's where all the employees would enter. The vans only enter the building right there through this roll-up door and they only exit in that area through two roll-up doors as they're released in 20 or 30 minute intervals, again, to make sure they don't just flood the streets in the area. It's a very technology-driven business where they know every day how many packages they have, where they're going, which van they should be given to, and then they route the vans for them. So the van knows exactly where it's going and where it'll drill, excuse me, deliver and come back. Commissioner Hang, do you have anything else? Um, thank you. That really helped answer a lot of the question, uh, questions that I have. And I'm glad to hear that regarding the purple area, from 10 at night to 10 in the morning, there's really no driving or activity per se. Oh, oh. Correct. There, there's no one on the outside of this building after 10 o'clock at night or before 7 in the morning. Uh, until the trucks start coming in in the employee area in the nighttime. But the vans, again, don't depart. Well, I'm taking it back. In the lavender area, no van driver shows up before 9. So no van driver shows up before 9. The vans start departing at 10. Because, again, the van drivers, we want them to arrive outside of the morning traffic peak of 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. So they will come in on site after everybody else has gone to work. So the big truck, the 14 big, the tr 14 big truck that is coming to dock and unload, that would be, I guess, I suppose not all eight of them coming out at the same time, I would assume? 
correct. In the, the daytime that we're using right now statistically, four would be coming in here from seven in the morning to seven at night. It could be more, it could shift. The balance of 10 a day would come in from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m., but it averages one over an hour apiece when you start looking at 10 trucks in a 12-hour period. So you're talking one truck an hour roughly coming down the street and coming into the property on a truck route that currently has a fairly high truck traffic volume. In fact, the traffic study even shows the amount of trucks that traverse this area because it's regional traffic going through on a truck route. Ten more trucks won't even be noticed to a great degree when you look at total traffic volume. Yes, residents across the street might see them if they're up in the middle of the night, but they should be quiet. They'll be decelerating to this point and turn in. When they turn out, they're going again eastbound on the south side of the street away from the homes. So we tried our best possible to design this in a way that has the least impacts on anybody living in the area. We've spoken to the city of Covina, city manager, assistant manager. They've reviewed the plans. They've provided their input to the city staff. So we seem to all be working together and going forward, and we think it's a good project. Thank you for explaining all that. Um, I really appreciate the fact that regarding the purple area, um, I understand that a lot of the van, the delivery van will be parking there, and that I just want to make sure that the time of movement of those vans is between 10, basically 10 at night time is the last time that they come in, and 10 in the morning is when they start moving out. Yes, the dispatching cannot start until 10 a.m. So they will not leave that building until 10 a.m. The drivers will show up around the 9 to 9.15 range, and then they are led in in groups, and they're packed. Or, I'm sorry, they are they're filled. In this group, maybe there's two groups in there at the same time. It may only be one in the morning. We don't know. But after they're filled, then they have all these dispatch employees, and they have a light signaling system on the ceiling that literally then tells them when to go, and it sends them out in waves so they don't overload the streets. Thank you. Vice Chair Liz. Sure, I have a few questions. Um, since this is a, a last mile delivery station, are there plans or is it anticipated that this site will ever be used for um, a starting off point for drone delivery service? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. I absolutely have never heard of that discussed in any Amazon that I've worked on. I've worked on five or six. Amazon's never discussed any drone deliveries of any kind out of any of their facilities I've seen. So this site, it's never been discussed. Um, I doubt they would even want to incorporate it in a residential area. What, would it be a problem to include, include that prohibition in the development agreement? I think it would probably be reasonable if that's what you feel. Um, um, with regard to employees, I, you know, ultimately, Amazon and, and, and other large multinational corporations are taking uh, significant steps toward automation of services. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, with regard to the number of employees that are going to be hired for this, uh, how many of them are going to stay on and for, for a, an extended period of time, and, and what commitment will Amazon make to actually hire actual people to be their employees, and is that something that you're willing to commit to in a development agreement? Uh, very good question. All of the Amazons I've worked on have basically been designed around a conveyor belt system. This is a three or four belt. If I had the floor plan up, you can see the belts. But it is not designed at all with any automation as far as self-loading in any way. It is a human labor type design where human labor offloads the trucks. They then put them on the one of four belts, the conveyor belts. The four conveyor belts go to different areas of the room and the sorters at that point. So it has the initial sorting off the truck, the next sorters sort down into pouches that go into the vans. Um, the labor uh, for this, again, is 250 jobs. If you look at the 
the break room or the lunch room, it's significant in size. So this is designed to accommodate uh, many employees inside. On night shifts, it has all the amenities that the employees would want to have. So we've been told that there's no plan for automation. There are no automatic arms or anything else like that. What? Robotics, I think I just heard the term. Right. Obviously, you know, self-driving vehicles are certainly on the horizon here. I think that's kind of a given. Um, and there's various, uh, there are various drone delivery services already in place, whether it's not just talking about in the air, mm. but on the sidewalk and, and, and in, in the streets mm. that are being implemented. Yes. Is that something that, that we should expect to see? I do not have the answers to that. We have never been told um, by Amazon they had any interest in doing the local drone, the, the ground level, like we see in the pizza commercials, whatever. Not heard any of that. I understand. It's, it's one of those things where I, I'm, I'm looking at this from the perspective of, you know, we're saying that there are mm -hmm. new jobs coming in. Supposedly fifteen dollar an hour minimum. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, if you do the math on that, you know, it's thirty thousand two hundred dollars if you have no time off. And mm -hmm. frankly, the average household income in West Covina is eighty three thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not like people with those jobs are going to be buying a place to live in our city, right? Uh, which is which is unfortunate. So I, I, I wanted to hear whether or not you guys have any plans to uh, assist. West Covina residents, um, particularly those that are that are hired into into those jobs, find housing in their area. The the fifteen dollar an hour commitment is the minimum, and there are various levels of supervision as well. So there are career advancements within the organization on the site. Um, I am not privy to all the pay scales within the business, uh, as far as assisting with any housing, anything. Uh, along that line of benefit, I'm not aware of any. Uh, to my knowledge, we are aware that they have a, um, they say, good quality medical benefits, insurance benefits. The difference in this case being the developer, Green Law Partners, buys, builds, and leases to Amazon. It's only a 10 year lease. So, in 10 years, if technology is something different, they don't wish to be here, they could leave the city. That's why the development agreement is a 10 year window frame for compensating the city. But I, much of their business also, I have to say, is proprietary in nature. They just don't like to discuss a lot of their internal business operations, but they committed to talking about, uh, you know, a minimum wage that's greater than, you know, the typical fast food. And I'm sure, you know, they have higher levels of supervision inside and others that are compensated. Because the associate is the lowest level on the inside in the sorting operation, and they have supervisors going up from there. But I apologize. I just can't answer, and I don't want to say something that I don't really know the answer to. I, I totally understand. Um, with, with, regard to, with regard to the sales tax replacement agreement, which yes. you had mentioned there as being over 10 years, um, in the event that Amazon des decides to renew, is there any reason why that that agreement cannot be extended for the additional period of time. Ab absolutely. That should should not be, or should that be included in the development agreement moving forward? Um, it absolutely can be extended. It could also be renegotiated. It becomes an open end, just like a lease. So, if Amazon chooses to stay. Um, I, you know, maybe that's a question that could be referred to your assistant city attorney here as far as the particulars. I don't recall the termination provisions as far as their rights to extend, but um, our expert's over here to my right. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, and then uh, with regard to um, the, it's going to be the upper, I guess, right-hand corner of the project site. Mm -hmm. um, where there is a um, an, an exit route, not not from the building, but the the upper right hand corner of the driveway. Um, yes. Can can vehicles turn left from San Bernardino Road 
uh, into the facility into that lot or are they only turning right there? The intent is that they would turn right in going westbound, I'm sorry, eastbound? So, so if, they're, if they're traveling uh, eastbound to westbound, mm -hmm. would they be able to make a left into the parking lot there? My understanding they could. Uh, the design of that street would have a double broken yellow line that has the center lane for left turns. It's also then a refuge, so when the vehicle comes out, it can have a safe refuge before it enters the lanes in a westbound direction. So yes, my understanding, they could come in there. The likelihood is it would only be a van that's probably parked in that upper part of the property versus Badillo. Yeah, I mean, my, my concern with that is that if you have vehicles coming from Azusa, which is the, the truck route, I mean, mm -hmm. that's likely how they're going to come particularly since you want the San Bernardino Road address designation. Mm -hmm. The concern that I see there is that you're going to have quite a stacking queue for people wanting to turn in there with their vans, and it's just going to cause a great deal of backup and potentially impact the, uh, um, the housing that's immediately adjacent to the... To the mm -hmm. Commissioner it's Lewis, maybe I can answer that. This sure. is Jana with traffic. Sure. <laughs> That driveway has been right turn in, right turn out only. Okay. That's why they said there'd be signage that says no left turn in. Okay, excellent. And they can't make a left turn out either. So it's right turn in, right turn out. Okay, perfect. I stand corrected. Verify that. Sorry. That answers the question. Thanks. <laughs> okay. And then, um, and then lastly, um, I, I wanted to ask regarding the, uh, the school district apprenticeship internship program what what is that going to entail I, I i read it in the report but i for the life of me i couldn't find it in the uh in the actual agreement i don't know if i skipped over it uh, but it's it's intended primarily high school age it could be college age but internships training programs and that uh, it, trying to look at ways to help replace the social services that the church provides. Because with the church departing this site, Amazon would like to contribute to the community in a way that socially is responsible. So that was one of the suggested ideas to help you know, generate interest in future jobs and careers for those young people that may not go to college, that may wish to go into the labor force. So it's geared to focus on the school district in the area and help those. I don't have any further details than that. I think it's the conditions basically to create the program in cooperation with the district and go from there. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes. Excuse me. So you made mention of other sites that you helped to facilitate, other, other sites that you helped to develop? Yes. And were those sites equal in size, large or smaller? They're comparable? Most sites that I have worked on were larger. I'd say the buildings were a lot larger. This is one of the smaller Amazon buildings. The site, though, the parking area is larger, and that's why they have the luxury of the van drivers being able to park on their own. Some of the sites, they, they don't have a great luxury of that amount of parking space. Um, but, you know, it's up for sale as it is. Amazon and Greenlaw would prefer not to leave part of it unimproved, plus, you know, it's, they want to make it nice. So it's going to all be asphalted again, re-asphalted, re-striped, new landscaping put throughout the parking lot, islands, new parking lot lighting to really improve it, but not touch the landscaping along the deal that's already mature and very attractive, or along the east property line that's very mature and attractive. So it's supplementing the middle of the property. But they, they range in size all over. It's just whatever comes on the market. Most all of these are not being built from the ground up. They are reuse of older industrial properties that I've seen. So you don't anticipate any adverse uh, value dropping in any of the neighborhood homes? Oh, not whatsoever. This, uh, you know, my background, I've been a city manager a deputy city manager, community development director in many cities. And when you have a deteriorated industrial building, which this is going to look like when the church moves out, that's not positive for your community. What's very positive is to reuse it 
Now, in this case, we're asking for an industrial zoning. This is not heavy industrial. This is not a plant that's going to produce paint vapors or sawdust. or It's not going to be manufacturing anything. It's about the cleanest type of industrial use you could have. A very clean, smooth operation that, quite frankly, most people in the community are invested in by being members and purchasing online. And we're not just talking about citizens. We're talking about businesses. Many, many of the businesses in your city and surrounding, they buy their supplies. They have their online business uh, website through Amazon. So it's supportive of all efforts of the community. Um, I don't see this at all being one that would affect values. I worked on one in the city of Mission Viejo that was surrounded by residential in all the areas, and there's definitely no effect on property values there. It's a positive. And in this case, it would show that your city is attracting a user back to the site. It's not had a labor-intensive use since the church bought it. And this, this is a good positive turnaround the other direction. And that's why I give credit to your staff. You have a very strong economic development program on your website that says your city wants to attract new business. You wish to attract jobs. You know, you're trying hard. I think you recently approved uh, your regulations for your new auto center. I mean, all these things that you're doing are exactly what you want to do to help improve all the values in the city, both residential and commercial. And to, to attract an Amazon, quite frankly, the competition for this, this use was pretty fierce in other cities. You won out. And you also won out uh, very much so because of your staff, the fact that you had a staff here that was willing to listen, that were positive, that I know many of your staff members over the years and others, and this was a known quantity to come to a city that we knew would understand and work with us. Uh, there are some cities out there that, you know, they, they just don't have the same customer service, but you have extraordinary customer service here, and you should be proud of all your employees. Thank you. I um, have one more question. You made mention of the heavy industrial. So after the 10-year after the 10-year lease is over, now this zone change is M1. Exactly, would that even allow heavy industrial in the future? Because I, I would think that that would be a concern for residents. The, the typical M1 zone allows very non-intrusive uses without a conditional use permit, with like storage and warehouse. But I can assure you, without even looking at your code book, almost every M1 zone in California, if you have any uses that generate noise, smoke, dust, debris, it's a conditional use permit. And with a conditional use permit, that's a discretionary decision by you. It has to come to you. and You can review it left and right. And a dis uh, conditional use permit, you have the right to deny. So you have full control in the zoning going forward. What's ironic is that new zone this warehouse in industrial, uh, warehouse in distribution, is a permitted use. So it shows you this, this type of use we're proposing in that zone is already a very low intensity type of classified use. It's not a manufacturing assembly like Honeywell had and Hughes Electronics. Those are manufacturing of electrical components and things such as that, and then shipping. So if you had to go industrial, this would be the best building to have? Oh. Gosh, yes. I mean, <laughs> to get this type of industrial user with this name, because this will attract other businesses. You know, there are suppliers to Amazon. There, uh, the van supply, the van servicing, your gas stations in this community. That condition says that the, this business should be buying local. Van drivers are to try to buy all their gas in your city. That's sales taxes. It's, it's all these compounding things that occur. And in any city's economic development program that I've spent years working in cities, you know, it just it's baby steps forward, and you just keep going forward, and you're doing a great job in your city. You've just really dramatically improved, and that's why you attracted Amazon. I mean, just frankly, that's what it is. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else in favor who would like to come up and speak? Madam Chair, um, just because of the numerous uh, amount of speakers, if we want, we could um, provide three minutes uh, for public comment. That would be good. We do have quite a few.
City, city attorney, can you, city attorney, can you clarify that? The, this uh, assistant city attorney, can you clarify the reasoning behind a three lim, a three minute limit needed? I think it's important to the residents, and we'll just keep the five minutes. Okay, so there are a couple of cards that don't say if you're for or against. So I'm going to go ahead and take yours first. Is there Percy Martinez? You are against. Do you, Madam Chair, do you want to clarify if there's anyone in favor? Or there's no one. Good evening. My name is Percy Martinez. I live on 1528 Sheffield Avenue, and I stand in opposition to this Amazon giveaway. I have been a resident of West Covina for over 22 years. I also worked as a driver for UPS, and I am a proud member of the Teamsters Union for over 43 years. <laughs> UPS jobs currently pay $41 an hour and allow many like me to live in West Covina. I was able to give my family a stability I wish I had growing up. And if you didn't know already, Amazon is an abusive employer that pays its workers $15 an hour, and he stated that a couple of times while increasing traffic, pollution, and may even lower property values around the warehouses it builds. Your Amazon giveaway will put all West Covina back a few years, and you should know tonight you are trading good union UPS jobs for Amazon McDonald jobs. I'm going to tell you where this is going. I recently retired, so I have a lot of time on my hands. I spent this afternoon canvassing with my Teamster Union in my neighborhood and no one knows what you guys are doing yet. I'm here tonight to voice my opposition to this development and to let you know that we are going to talk to as many residents as we can and let them know how you are giving away the farm. Now one thing that he said there was like 8,000 people that come out of the church, that's one day a year. If you do the math, those numbers, 142 delivery vans times 365, that's 50 something thousand. No, you know what? It's not a good deal. Thank you. Michael Van Rolt, Jay. I'd like to say that um, I also worked for, uh, um, for the state of California for 20 years, so. Um, I feel like uh, that should be recognized. I worked for uh, uh, the Highway Patrol as a dispatcher, and I worked for the Department of Water Resources. If you can bring back that uh, future site plan, I can show you where I live. And, and I'd like to tell you that there'll be 12 residences in the condominium complex. By the way, we're in Covina, so that didn't really get much attention when they were looking at this. Covina, you know, nobody came to my door and canvassed at my door. Um, there's, there's gonna be 12 residences that are out on San Bernardino. That's where their door is. And the way I read it, it's gonna be two trucks an hour during the day and one truck an hour at night, so 14 trucks, that doesn't equal the same amount. And I read it from the 600 and some pages that were, I don't know if you all read the, that whole proposal. Um, I'd also like to point out where they plan on putting the traffic light. And I know if you're rich enough that you can go into outer space, you can do just about anything. But there is a major um, drainage canal that runs under the street right where that is so when they go to change it it's not going to be just bulldozing and regrading they're gonna have to deal with that drainage canal if you go over there and look you'll see all of the um, uh, the water and by the way um, or where the waters gather from the from the uh, drains but um, behind the um, uh, Wood Lane Village um, between us and Las Palmas Middle School, 
um, is uh, where that drainage is open, and then it turns into uh, going under the street. Um, also, they didn't take into consideration the comings and goings from uh, the people dropping off and picking up their kids at Las Palmas off of Cutter Way. Um, I, and the other school on, on uh, Lark Allen, yes. Um, let me just flip back. There are, beside the um, Wood Lane Village, which is directly across from that building, there are four more apartment buildings between where the red is coming, where they're planning on putting on the, uh, the stoplight, and Lark Allen, a, a distance of less than um, a half a mile. Uh, there is uh, six... There's hundreds of, of families on that side of the street, by the way. There's um, uh, six driveways. Um, a couple of them are almost directly across from the two on the east side. And I've lived there for 20 years. There's accidents there because it's, it's difficult. And so I can only see a lot more accidents happening with the vans coming and going with the additional traffic there. Um, West on San Bernardino Road, about a mile and a half, there was a church, and they sold, and they built houses there. And I know West Covina's collecting taxes from those houses, and that's not going to be for 10 years. That's going to be for many, many, many years. Why can't we put houses there? You'll get a good tax revenue off of that. And the schools are already there, <laughs> so... So I know that there's people that are going to be moving out of my, you know, neighbors that I have because they don't want, uh, by the way, a truck makes a certain amount of noise. When it comes to a stop and then it gets the stoplight to change and it makes a left turn, it has to rev its engine. That's going to happen all night long for those residents that are closest to that corner. So... I just see it as, as being a devaluing of, of my property and the property of those 68 other um, condo units that are on that corner. Um, I think I've run out of steam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sherry Oriana. Madam Chair, Commission, staff, and community. My name is Sherry Oriana. I'm with Teamsters Local 1932. My nexus with the city is I represent the civilian police department employees at the police department. The reason I'm here tonight is I've been watching this, and I've written a response to the mitigated negative declaration. I had to point that out so I didn't say it right. Right. I could. Um, and I have a, a large three-page document that I submitted for tonight. So I'm not going to go over that. So let's talk about what we've heard. Let's talk about what we're going to hear. This is a huge project. It is not a little delivery station that Mr. Lamb will have you believe. Okay, let's talk about, you know, I wrote down some notes from what I'm hearing. Let's talk about jobs. How will these jobs serve the city? How is this location going to serve the city? 250 jobs. They're not all going to be employed by Amazon. You have de delivery service providers that are going to be dealing with the drivers. They're going to be hiring these drivers. $15 an hour? That is not a livable, sustainable wage. These drivers are working two and three jobs to make ends meet. 
They will not come into your community and sit and thrive in your restaurants and have a beer after work because either they're going somewhere else to work or they don't make enough money to do that. And they're not buying the insurance that these companies are providing because it takes away from the little amount of money they make per hour. And there's absolutely no pension provided for them via Amazon or any of these delivery service providers. How is this a good, sustainable, living wage? How does that benefit this community? And are they going to guarantee that they're going to offer these jobs to the residents of this community? Somebody pointed out, are they going to be able to provide for housing and live in, in this community? I'm appalled that Mr. Lamb thinks $15 is a good, sustainable living wage. I'm sure he makes a heck of a lot more money than that. And I went with my brother, and I canvassed this area. They talked to 29 peoples within a 300-foot radius. I went to Elginia. We walked Grove Center. I believe it's Grove Center. We walked Louisa, and we walked El Dorado. And we hit over close to 100 houses. I have statements from 13 residents who said, yes, I don't, wanna, I don't want to reduce uh, my home value. I'm worried about traffic. I'm worried about noise. I'm worried about air quality. They're worried about this stuff. Are they here tonight? There's quite a few here tonight. And you're going to hear from them. I'm happy to hear about that. But there were a lot of elderly residents that weren't going to be able to get out here tonight. So to tell me that you talked to 29 people, that's deplorable. You have thousands of people that live within the center and are going to be impacted, not to mention Grove Elementary School, not to mention the other schools that were mentioned. There's, uh, there is a kindred hospital right there. There's a lot. And, and you, I'm sorry, <laughs> I mean that negatively. Madam Williams, when you asked about the increased traffic during um, peak holiday times, all of a sudden, Mr. Lamb couldn't come up with a, a number for you. Well, 914 times two, that's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty knowledgeable. That's 1,800. Where are we gonna park the extra vans? What's gonna happen there? I live in a community where I'll tell you where they put the extra vans. They took over an old Kmart shopping center and they put 75 vans in that shopping center and put up high intensity lights and put in security so you couldn't enter the place. And then they didn't even go to the city council for approval. So you're gonna have a lot of issues on your hands. When it comes to specifics that he wants you to know, he's all over it. But when it comes to specifics that the community needs to know, he's not sure of it. He's, well, we have to think about that, we're not sure. We haven't studied that yet. This is the time to study that. This is the time to take that into consideration. This is a beautiful area up there, and these homes are going to suffer. They're going to suffer. Their property values are going to degrade. They're going to be reduced. These drivers, they come on duty, and they've got so many minutes to get these, these, uh, these packages delivered. They're not going to stay in your city. They're not going to add to the city. This whole project is not going to add to this city, which is the ninth worst city in the state of California, under audit and on the verge of bankruptcy. This is not the program for this city. Thank you. Randy Davis. Yes. Good evening, my name is Brandi Davis and I live right across from the pink road. <laughs> so when I heard about this, it was not two years ago, it was a few weeks ago. Was not able to make it to the August meeting because I didn't even hear about it. We live right across the street so it's very surprising that we weren't included because that's where the stoplight is going to be installed or planned to be installed is three to four car lengths away from my front door. All the time I hear cars flying around, that's flying down that street, screeching to stops, 
since COVID began, it's a raceway. So the light might help, but it's also gonna be a place where people accelerate, decelerate. There's been numerous car accidents there because people park on both sides of the street, which is, and people crash into those cars all the time. So an additional amount of trucks and cars is very disturbing. Um, there's so much street noise and I keep hearing less than significant or no impact. That's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible. I don't know if anyone's ever needs to come, park themselves right there. The, where I looked at this um, initial study that I found online, um, where they put some of the microphones was way back on Cutter. Several, like five or six houses, oh, I'm so nervous. <laughs> five or six houses away from the street. Five or six house lengths. They went back in the driveway with one of those microphones. That's not accurate. Um, church on Sunday was where the traffic came in. One day a week, a couple of hours. There's actually a police officer who would park right next to Cutter to help to keep it safe because it is somewhat of a blind turn when you're making a left because there's always cars there. So they worked on keeping a safe the people passing by, people trying to turn on the six or seven hours on Sundays. There's no um, policeman that's going to be parked there 24-7. I hear the trucks go by, my house shakes. Ten or so, one per hour overnight, I'm definitely going to hear it. It's not going to be, and not just me, but all of us families that live right there. And again, like the last woman said, 912, at one point he said that would be the max. That's not what the information says about how many people are gonna be there. Um, I have been to, uh, I work for Amazon quite a bit, in fact. People come from quite a distance to come to work. I worked at the City of Industry. Um, what is this called again? Delivery Station. It's on Valley between Hacienda and, I forgot that street, full industrial area. And industrial areas are the locations that are preferable for these types of businesses. I ask that you don't approve this zone change to make it a business, um, regardless of if it was back in the 70s. Um, a lot of, I think our, that, wasn't built till 1980, and many of the longtime residents like Michael, it was never a business. So when we bought and when it was built, it wasn't like a full-blown industrial area. The 12-foot wall that they're putting in certain areas doesn't extend to all of the us that live right off of San Bernardino. So we don't have that noise reduction, the light reduction, the pollution and the noise reduction. He talked about it being a win. It's not a win for all of us. It's a huge loss, a loss of peace of mind, a loss of quiet, which we all need now in this time and day that we're living in. Um, one of the community benefits that he listed was, if it happens that the backup lights are noisy, we'll go back and see what we're gonna do. That happens so many times. Like, we'll go back and see, are they really gonna go back? Who's gonna? Man, those, if we're calling in, talking about the noise, is it really gonna make them reduce business? Are they really gonna say, oh, we've had 20 complaints from the neighborhood this week, but we're expecting Prime Day, uh, the 10, the many weeks of Christmas, that we're gonna reduce business for these people? It's not gonna happen. So again, I ask that you don't approve this and recommend that it's turned down. Thank you. Thank you. Robinson? There's no first name. Robinson?
Good evening, uh, Bill Robinson, resident. Uh, uh, I'm gonna go through the comments real quick with the conclusion first. Uh, we members of the neighborhood urge you to table resolutions 93 to 98 and this incomplete work product, uh, I mean all those uh, entitlements that were just listed, uh, require an adequate uh, in initial study uh, so that you have the facts to come to a legal CEQA determination and that uh, furthermore, you do not use your zoning powers to, to screw up our existing neighborhood, including but not limited to uh, compromising our property values. Fix all the problems listed, I'll uh, talk about, and then continue so that due process is provided under CEQA to our local community. Now, my comments, I'll, I'll just list them. Uh, starting at comment uh, four. Uh, the project proponent, proponent can identify environmental f effects by use of a checklist, but the checklist is incorrectly filled out and therefore this initial study is not adequate. West Covina does not now have adequate information to use as the basis for deciding whether to prepare uh, one of the three uh, proposed uh, environmental documents. Therefore, action tonight would not be legal under CEQA. Comment five. My own view of this project are significantly different than the facts before you tonight. My analysis indicates that a full master ER together with all the needed planning documents, including but not limited to information to use on the basis for deciding whether to prepare an environmental uh, report including all required entitlements uh, needed needed to be included. Comment six, zoning of such a facility is not compatible to that of a residential bedroom community. If we in our neighborhood had wished to live near a regional distribution warehouse, we could have purchased homes in Irwindale or the city of industry. Comment seven, other areas of this initial study analysis that are inadequate include the below enumerated six areas. I'll skip through those six. They're in the, the writ on, in writing. Comment eight, uh, no mitigated community benefits have so far been discussed as yet in this initial study analysis, except the $4 million sales tax fee. Comment nine, Mandatory findings of significance, traffic density. The zoning issues are incompatible with this adjacent residential neighborhood. All the elements described below are significant impacts. And I list, uh, I list them. I'll skip that right now. Comment 10. These mandatory findings of significance are cumul cumulative effects presented that are significant which argues for the no project alternative. 11, zoning. Uh, traffic, the environment and ambience of the immediate neighborhood, quality of life, property values, industrialization, pollution, and quality of life uh, degradation aspects. 12, Amazon delivery station, uh, uh, the negative deck is flawed and needs to be tabled until it can be completely uh, sufficiently and adequately and only then submitted for planning commission approval. 13, uh, piecemealing or segmenting means dividing a project into two or more pieces and evaluating each piece in a separate environmental document rather than evaluating the whole of the project in one environmental document. It appears that Amazon uh, delivery project is considering all potential, uh, potential future actions in this specific plan. However, if, th if this is not the case, then Amazon project uh, would be taking a course significantly counter to the CEQA process. Unintended consequences. Uh, if this project goes through and is successful uh, and we start uh, delivering all the goods, uh, that could potentially put the West Covina Mall uh, out of business. 
and the council would have a new location to put the five-star hotel that they want to put on BKK. So uh, if, you know, if this succeeds, uh, the uh, existing mall might go down. Thank you. Cheryl Perez. Good evening. Um, my name is Cheryl Perez, and I actually manage Lark Ellen Village Apartments. <laughs> so we would be the neighbor to this project that you're proposing. Um, I want to first say that Lark Ellen is a partnership with the City of West Covina. You help fund the affordable housing property that we have. And I was shocked to find out that this deal has been going on for two years, but yet we were never notified. We were never no one ever came to our building and knocked on doors. Um, very few residents even received the first notice that went out by Ms. Burns. The management office was never notified. We were never asked any questions about this project going on. And I did attend the Zoom meeting and a lot of our questions were answered, but we do have some concerns. So. My concerns are for my 200 residents, 98 seniors, 102 families, and 62 children that live at Lark Ellen Village. Um, I wanna say that the information is wrong regarding the sound wall or the wall that we share with the property. The wall only extends about 50% of the property line. The rest is a wrought iron fence with trees and shrubbery. So. Originally, when I spoke with Dean Navarro, he told me that we would be receiving a sound wall there going the length of our property. And then in the presentation, that was now turned to a sound wall being built only on Badillo Avenue. So I want to know um, why those changes were made when it's not the uh, sound wall they're intending to build will not even help our property, help our residents at all, which 50% of the property will have an open view through the wrought iron fence of all the vans coming and going. So that needs to be resolved. Two, it was never mentioned in the Zoom uh, webinar uh, meeting about them painting the existing white curbs red at every entrance to have a clear view. That's gonna impact our neighborhood on both Badillo Avenue and San Bernardino Road. Those curbs are used for apartment living for uh, residents to park their cars. All along San Bernardino Road, we have, I believe it's six apartment buildings in the condo community that use the curb parking for their vehicles. If you come in and change those curbs to red, that's greatly going to impact our, it's gonna physically impact our communities. Um, let's see. Number, uh, I, okay, and lastly, this is not a, a big issue, but um, currently, Lark Hill and Village, we have public restrooms. Guess who uses our public restrooms at this time during, uh, during the day to go to the restroom? Amazon drivers. They continually knock on my window frantically, can we use your restroom? You know, of course, we open the gate, we let them in, we let them use the restroom. So that is a concern I also have. So based on the new property that's being built, will these contracted drivers have use of a public facility to use the restroom or will they need to continue to find restaurants and business owners that will let them in to use the restaurant while they're doing their deliveries? Um, and again, I agree with the other speakers. I also live in the city of West Covina. I, I live um, up by Sunset and Puente. We never received a notice. No one ever came to my door. Um, if this has been going on for two years, why did we not reach out to the community sooner? Why, like the, uh, I believe Brandy said, you know, why was it just 
uh, in the month of August where we even notified that this was taking place, we should have been included in a decision like this. Um, and I guess lastly, I'm just concerned for my residents. Um, if you look at the map, it, so for the first half of the property that runs from San Bernardino south towards Padillo, those are senior units. So there's roughly 30 senior units that will be facing Amazon. So I'm just concerned for their well-being, their, their sleeping at night, like how that's going to impact them, especially with the trucks coming down San Bernardino Road. As Brandy did point out, the, the ground shakes. And so if we're going to be having this many trucks driving, um, I just want you to consider that. And then uh, for the rest of the property, my 69 children that do walk to Grove Center School, that is also a concern of mine. So thank, thank you for your time. Thank you. Steve Pritchard. Steve Pritchard. Madam Chair, Commission. Uh, as a nearby homeowner to the proposed delivery station, I have concerns about its effects on the neighborhood, the community, and for the workers. For the neighborhood, increased traffic and the ensuing increase in air pollution for the community. A large Amazon footprint will be to the detriment of local businesses and for the workers. who have been subject to historically poor labor practices, anti-union mobilization, and minimal job security and no upward mobility. The neighborhoods surrounding the station will suffer the poor air quality, road deterioration, and noise that comes with the influx of vehicles. An area that is already hostile to pedestrians and children, children playing will become more so, decreasing the quality of life for my kids and my neighbors. The Amazon effect on local mom and pop enterprises is something that should be noted before we join in with their small business killing philosophy. The, these stores that have been, long been part of the community do not stand a chance. Even the large businesses that we host in the plaza or Eastland are struggling to complete with the tax dodging monolith that is hoping to claim West Covina as territory in their march to dominance. A 2015 analysis found that Amazon sales displaced retail outlets that would have paid 528 million in property taxes. Amazon, for their part, liked to bypass such paperwork. But even the sales tax that local residents pay when shopping for Amazon goods will not nearly cover the expansive in infrastructure maintenance needed for the daily arrival of 18 wheelers, trucks, and cars that will descend on our neighborhood 24 seven. And finally, the workers at Amazon the jobs that are created are bad jobs. <laughs> Amazon has the unique ability to strangle the local economy to the point where these jobs are considered essential to the workers, but workers are deemed easily replaceable to Amazon. Working conditions are dangerously poor. Technology has been used to track workers' movements and discipline and termination greets those who do not move enough during their shift. The turnover rate of hourly employees in 2019 was 150%. If we think we bring good jobs to the city, then the data disagrees. Also, Amazon has made no secret of their journey towards autom automation. Ideally for their business model, West Covina will soon host a warehouse full of robots with 18-wheeler trucks and self-employed Amazon associates delivering the product. I'm hoping that the Planning Commission shares my concern and agrees on the net negative impact of welcoming Amazon's delivery station to our city. Are you? Thank you. Tobias? Tobias? My name's Tobias. I live in the apartments right next to the site proposal in Lark Island Apartments. And to my understanding, the jobs that are going to be created for $15 an hour are not, as they, everyone's saying, livable wages. I understand that. They're entry levels for part-time workers, high school, 
you know, college kids, whatever. They're not there to make a living off of it, just an entry. The revenue being generated from this, I hope can be used to fix up West Covina. The sidewalks around the Lark Allen apartments where the elderly do their walks is very dangerous. People have fallen down and tripped, okay? There were also the revenue being generated since you already made the decision to go ahead and go with this plan, can 10%, 20% be put aside for the health care or, or the, what is it, uh, the planning of Los Angeles that don't give us the money. The, own, the health department that we, West Covina wants to do itself. Okay, there's no funding for that already. If you already approved of this, 10, 20% be put aside to start that off. Even though I wish you guys could put that on hold, okay, because there's a lot of questions on that. As far as the noise is concerned for, the, for the, our, my residents as well as uh, Cheryl's, we are concerned for the noise that does go out. But I did all want to walk around. Semi-trucks do make a certain amount of noise. There is a certain amount of vibration. I'm a young man. I really don't hear it as much. The senior sees, they don't like it, and that's understandable. I just hope since you already approved of this is that you take our considerations and try to work with Amazon to reconcile it. Because I, if I'm understanding, you represent the property owner. I don't see a re uh, Amazon representative here to answer questions. He answered the question to the best of his ability, but he's not representing Amazon to my understanding. So where are they at? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa Pastor. Uh, good evening, Chair Brissetta and members of the commission. Uh, my name is Elisa Pastor, and I am legal counsel for the owner of the Lark Ellen uh, property right next door. Um, as uh, Cheryl mentioned, it's a 122-unit, 100% affordable housing complex. So we share a 650-foot property line with this uh, facility, and as she mentioned, it actually is not a wall. There's part wall and part um, wrought iron fence, and so we're very concerned about the impacts. Now, we're not here to stop this project. We're here to make this project better, to have conditions of approval that are appropriate operating conditions to protect the residents both of our development but of the other places. And, you know, we're really disappointed that if this project's been going on for two years, it hasn't been vetted with us. Tom Saffron, who's the owner, Tom Saffron and Associates, who's the owner of this project, has also developed 6,000 units across Southern California. They are one of the most committed clients I have ever seen to community outreach. Uh, one of the last projects I did with them, we probably had 35 community outreach meetings. Last night, I had a, got a project approved, because usually I'm on the other side, honestly. We had probably 60 meetings with people, and we got unanimous approval because we do the work to get the community to come to the table and to address their concerns. And so... What I'm hearing is there's a lot of promises about we have all these operating conditions and we're going to not have vehicles in the, and no movement in this area between you know, 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. But none of those things are in the development agreement. None of those things are in the conditions of approval, and they are not mitigation measures. So they are not enforceable. And you might hear, oh, well, if it's in the project description, you can go in and you can enforce it. I know all the tricks, right? <laughs> I've been on the other side of this. We need things to be in the conditions of approval to protect the residents. And so we, um, I submitted a letter today, and it's got very extensive suggestions for the conditions of approval. So I want to walk through some of those with you. But, like, let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So the traffic study and the traffic analysis talks about how there are various alternative measures, including um, van pool, uh, pre-tax subsidy, and some other things, and that's supposed to mitigate the impact. So if that's going to mitigate the impact, it needs to be a mitigation measure 
so it is enforceable. It's not a mitigation measure. It's not a condition. There's no guarantee that Amazon is going to do any of those things. And so we want them to integrate these conditions into the approval. We want there to be a noise monitor um, at the, they did not take any noise measurements at the property line between our properties. And we would like for there to be an enforceable condition that says the noise cannot exceed an increase of five dBA during the day and three dBA at night. If in fact there is no one who is going to be using that purple area, this shouldn't be a problem. There needs to be a condition that says there can be no vehicles coming or going from that area between 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. Or 10 p.m. to 10 a.m., rather. Um, we would like to see a 12-foot wall, just like the sound wall that is being um, integrated into the western part of the site between our property. To the extent that any landscaping gets removed, it can be, put, it can be replaced. Um, We've been told there are standard operating conditions by Amazon that don't let people play music, they can't smoke next to us, they can't do all these things. Great, I love that. Let's make them conditions, right? Let's make them enforceable. Um, we'd also very much like to see, uh, I think it was Commissioner Hang that noticed that there was four uh, driveways on Badillo and three on San Bernardino. We'd like to see uh, those easternmost driveways closed. We're a little unclear why the traffic circulation is such that you've got all these vans that are going right by a property line. Let's move the drive aisle over. Let's move it over and make there to be less impact. And then our last concern is really about the lighting. Um, we'd like to see, we'd like to make sure that lighting levels are not increased. Um, there was very specific lighting requirements in the previous plan for the church, and so we want to see those either maintained or for the lighting to be less. To the, uh, I think uh, one of the staff was talking about the foot candles. Again, let's make that a condition of approval. So let's make this a project where if there are issues, we can come in and we can work with the city. We have reached out to the developer. We, reached out, we had a conversation last week. We are happy to work with them on these conditions and making this to be um, a facility that can benefit everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Alfonso Contreras. Good evening, Madam Chair Becerra and members of the commission. My name is Alfonso Contreras. I live in Palm Park, your neighboring city. I've attended and I was also a former planning commissioner, but not for West Covina, but for, but for Baldwin Park for many, many years. The reason I'm here is not only is it affecting West Covina, it's affecting Covina, it's affecting the school districts and Baldwin Park and many other communities. You talked about a four million or the staff recommended or talked about the four million dollars that the city will get over the next 10 years. You gotta be kidding yourselves. Ask your public works how much it costs to repave from Lark Allen to Vincent, from Odillo to Vincent, from Vincent to Vadillo, and so on and so forth. You're going to spend more than $4 million in the 10 year. So you're not getting any benefit from those $4 million. And this is, again, I like the vice chair's questions and everybody else's. You know, the cost, you're gonna spend more money in road repairs than what you're actually gonna get. I'm not against Amazon, they're a great company. But it's like someone mentioned, where are they today? It's not something against Mr. Lamb. It's against the company. The richest men in the world, $15 an hour, guess what? Ask Kmart how much they get, $15. They can't even get employees. How many places have you gone says help wanted signs? $15 an hour. It's not worth it to them. So it's not a benefit, as some of the publics have mentioned, as Vice Chair Lewis mentioned, the $15 an hour, you cannot, no one can buy a house. Someone that heads a family cannot raise a family in West Covina or any community here in the San Gabriel Valley, period. So it's not. I, the slide that we had about transportation, that transportation, those signs, the red signs and everything they mentioned, the signals, 
they're only benefits for Amazon because if they didn't put the traffic signal, those trucks, as they mentioned, tractor trailers, could not make a right-hand turn or could not make a left-hand turn. They're not for the benefit of the residents of the community. It's the benefit of the tenant that will be coming to this facility if it happens. Okay. Uh, just again, the environmental. Remember their schools. They mentioned about the hours that they're not going to be coming in at 7 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning. That's great. But how many elementary schools, junior high schools you have in the area? Kids are playing there. It's not a quiet neighborhood where the trucks go by. Someone mentioned cities of Irwindale and industry and so on and so forth. You check out other Vernon cities, there's no schools there. And the smog and everything else is bad for the community. You heard about some battery companies because of the environment. And again, they're going to be driving because that location is not near any type of freeways. So the traffic, I don't care what time of the day it is, San Bernardino Road, Badillo, Vincent, Lark Allen, and so on and so forth, it's going to be affected both east and west. The signals are not synchronized by any ways. Can you imagine? I had to stop at Lark Allen. Now on the new signal, and now on Vincent, and now on Sunset, and now on Orange. How many times have you guys been stuck? Like, you got a green light, but you cannot move. Why? They're not synchronized. I got a green light, but if I move to the middle, I'm going to block the uh, traffic going the other direction. And again, I mentioned about tearing up the streets. That, to me, is the biggest thing. Again, the church, as is mentioned by this lady here in the front, is only dealt with on Sundays. The West Covina Police Department was hired to do traffic controls one day a week. The, it's all Amazon's needs that they needed, not because it's benefited the city. It's benefiting the tenant, and it's not, again, something, again, Mr. Lamb. I, too, am retired. I come out of retirement because I, I don't know why. Maybe I'm crazy to help the community. That's what I'm here for, to help this community, whether it's West Covina. I used to represent this area and many other cities in the water. So you might know me more as the water guy from the Upper St. Gabriel Valley Municipal Water District or Valley County Water because that's where I served for 23 years as an elected official. But more of it is I'm opposing it because it's not the right place, not, it's not because it's Amazon or anybody else. It's not in the right location. It's also a former board member of ours. It's not industry. It's not everyone there. It's not Vernon. Thank you very much for your time and have Thank a great you. evening. JD? Good evening. Um, let me admit that I was a bit cowardly to come up here and say that I was in favor of Amazon, um, but I am. Uh, I have mixed feelings, however, and I have a concern. Um, the concern has been expressed in many ways. The gentleman that just left expressed it pretty well. And that's the quality of life, the effect of quality of life. I do I do my phone? I heard the applicant representative say that certain roads have to be required for traveling. I happen to live on one of the minor artilleries, arteries, arteries of the cities in West Covina. He also mentioned that the trucks, the larger trucks that Ms. Hank referred to would be traveling Azusa to San Bernardino over to the Amazon Center. But I know from experience that these smaller arterial roads are being used by larger trucks. That is Lark Allen and Valinda as a shortcut. Maybe this question would be better answered by the city manager at a different time, probably in the same location, but a different time. Is Lark Allen and Valinda, which is now being used as a shortcut to circumvent the heavy traffic that business and commercial vehicles have to experience traveling Azusa and Glendora with the Amazon 
larger vehicles be prohibited from using those minor streets because they're lined with residents, homes. They're not, I don't think, traditionally intended to be used as major commuting uh, streets. So I'm hoping that he'll be able to, either he'll be able to answer it or the city manager will be able to give me a peace of mind, give me some peace of mind in terms of the impact that the Amazon larger vehicles will or may have on these two minor road avenues. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak who's opposed to this project? You have fill, her fill out a pink card. Go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Christine Carrillo. I live on Grove Center, which is two streets uh, south of Badillo. I noticed that you spoke about the route going up Azusa to San Bernardino Road, but you never spoke about, it, you also spoke about the vans that would go in and out and could turn right and left. Those uh, vehicles that are gonna be turning left will make their way to Vincent and they'll be going up and down Vincent that will be passing a lot of residential streets and those vans will make their way to Grove Center, which is a major segue. It's, it's right off of Vincent, where we, we get a lot of traffic that speeds up and down those streets anyway. Um, I can foresee that there's going to be lots of shortcuts being taken. I also am curious as to the route where Vincent is and getting on and off the freeway. Now, I, I, I saw that you said that the large trucks have specific routes that will be going north on um, Azusa, and that's their designated route for those large trucks. But who's to say they're not gonna be on the freeway and get off on Vincent? Make a mistake, oh, regularly, and going up and down Vincent, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, there's so many residential streets right off of that. There's just no, there's no way that that can be avoided. I mean, explain this to me. Does anybody have any answers to that? Those, those uh, elementary schools that, and, and the residential uh, area there that you guys are talking about not being affected between 10 and 10 o'clock, what about after 10 o'clock? Schools get out at two o'clock. There's going to be large amounts of vans, you know, coming in and out of those streets. I mean, it, it's hard enough trying to be super, super careful when those kids are, are on those streets. It's not just Grove Center Street. It's not, it's Roland. It's, it's also the, the elementary school that's, I don't remember the name of it. It's just, a little bit north of Grove Center. These kids are all over the streets walking home from 12 o'clock to 2.30 or 3 o'clock. And then you're talking about Azusa? You have kids from Trawick School walking those streets. And those streets are so congested. And it's not just Trawick School, it's the high school. How do you think it's gonna affect our school districts? This is just so ridiculous, and I'll tell you something. Everybody seems to be so surprised that we got no information on this. We got information on this three days ago, four days ago, when they came to the door. I, I might have that wrong. It was last week, maybe, three, four days, Saturday. There was a flyer left handed to me by my son. I mean, come on. This is ridiculous. If the city knew, if more people in this city knew about it, you probably would have much bigger turnout. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm heartbroken. I mean, I wish I knew more information about Amazon coming to town. I wish I had a longer period of time to do research and really know 
that I, I'm strongly opposing it, but in this short period of time, I totally oppose it. It's just, I mean, I order from Amazon. I'm not, I'm not going to stand here and be a hypocrite about it, but this is a residential neighborhood. Yes, we have a uh, city of industry. We have uh, Irwindale. I mean, come on, there's so much dead space there. It's right next to the freeway. I, I just, this is, this is heartbreaking. You know, this West Covina should be a lovely residential neighborhood. I'm not saying Amazon will, you know, t completely take away from that. But you know what, this really needs to be looked at for a longer period of time. I think that there's other things that could have been looked at. I mean, I don't know if, I'm, if I got this wrong, but you said $80,000 a year in tax taxes will be gained to West Covina. Am I wrong about that? A year? I mean, that seems like nothing. That's nothing. I mean, come on, people. There's, there's a lot of dead space. Build some more homes. You know, bring some younger population here. You know, this is ridiculous. I think that's about all I have to say. Oh, my time's up. At this time, we'll allow a rebuttal from the applicant, Mr. I, Lamb. Uh, Madam Chair, if I may, um, uh, I think because there's so many questions unanswered still, and it's probably best for the applicant to put this in a presentation format, that I will make a motion that we table this until, and of course, in accordance with city staff and the applicant, that we table this until the next meeting. So. At least the applicant could put all the information he got today into factual Mr. presentation. Lamb, do you need more time? Pardon, pardon me, the question again? Um, my motion was that... I'm sorry, I heard the motion, but the question was <laughs> of me, I need you more need time. need additional time for, to answer, to put a presentation together to answer all the questions. I'm, I'm prepared right now to answer these questions and the issues raised. Yeah, proceed. I'm just, I'm gonna just make a general comment. It's probably best for you to reach out to those individual homo, homeowners in that area and then come back and, and make a strong point. I personally believe that this will create great opportunity in our community, but there's unanswered questions that the local community has and it should be answered. Now, at the same time, I do believe um, that if we, if we don't take an opportunity like this, that this will become an, the next Hooter site, which became infested and dirty and unmanaged, unmaintained. And if, and if Faith Community Church wants to sell this property, they have every right to do so. And and we don't want this property just to sit there and, and have the opportunity for individuals to break in and commit crimes and so forth. But at the same time, I do believe that there's some so many unanswered questions that Many of the residents in that surrounding community still have, and it's probably best by the end of this meeting. Instead of being here for another two hours and having residents here rate, but most importantly, there's unanswered questions. So I, it's a, a comment that it's probably best to put it in a presentation again so this commission can know f for sure that each of these answers have been answered and, and that maybe you have an opportunity to visit the local apartments there and the local surrounding houses. I know there, I think a lot, uh, city staff, is those housing ho houses in Covina or in West Covina? Those houses are located in West Covina, across the street, on Badillo? Across the street, it's Co Mr. Lamb, how, how was, uh, how, how much the time ones were the residents Mark Allen is in how were they okay. notified? South of it. How were the residents notified and how much time were they given? How much notice? This entire process involved public hearing notices. So under state law, every property owner within 300 feet of the boundaries of the property. Please allow him to speak. Thank you. May I continue, Madam? Yes. Thank you. So 300 feet from the exterior boundaries of the property, all property owners, all tenants, of rentals, and that's in Covina and West Covina, all the way around. Those notices were first sent out 
when the mitigated negative declaration was finished and available, notice went out to everyone, said, it's available to read for the next 30 days. Please read it. Here it is online. If you have any questions or comments, please submit those. We received, or the city staff, not me, city received several comments. Every one of those comments that were received was responded to by all the consultants in this room with answers. As we move forward then to this first hearing tonight, in addition to the public outreach that we had, which I believe was far more extensive than conveyed tonight, because we sent notices again to all of these uh, area residents, tenants, every tenant in Lark Ellen received our community outreach notices. We had an online presentation to explain this project. I gave it. There were only six non-city employees that signed up and watched that. So I, I understand what people are saying tonight. I, I understand, sir, what your concerns are. What I'm trying to convey is we've been asked to do this outreach. We've tried. We haven't elicited any major concerns or comments of any extent. Tonight, yes, you've had many people speak, but you've had, and I'm not belittling this, only 13 people spoke tonight. So that's 12 in opposition, one in favor. This is pretty typical of any meeting I work on. Excuse me, uh, Chair Becerra. Uh, you each had a time to speak. This is his turn. Thank you. May I proceed? Yes. So public notice has been sent out for this hearing as well. They went out to the same 300-foot radius. Everyone who lived or rents in Covina and West Covina around all the properties. You received, I think, a total of four or five letters and tonight again 13 people. For the number of people that were notified, this is not a significant number. And I understand that there's the appearance that more questions need to be answered. I'm prepared right now to go through every single one of these that were raised and give you the answers that I feel again reflect the accuracy of all the documents. You've had city employees review all these documents. You've had two sets of consultants on every CEQA document. We're actively working with the attorney of the like Clark Ellen complex. Uh, we've already indicated a willingness to come up with suggested conditions maybe that work out between us. But we received that letter today. And uh, that's why if I may take the time for a few minutes here to go back through some of these, it might give you some greater comfort level if I can at least explain our side so, of it. So like for example, on Amazon's website, it, it states that along with the starting pay of at least $15 per hour, more than double the federal minimum wage, Amazon offers a range of great benefits to support employees and eligible family members, including domestic partners and their children. These comprehensive benefits begin on day one and include health care coverage, parental leave, and ways to save for the future and other resources to improve the health and well-being. But so this is just an example, and it's my recommendation that instead of you verbally giving this information for another hour or two, that you come back prepared and you bring you bring these factual information and you put it in a PowerPoint because in, in the end of the day, people want answers and. Uh, we're not saying that we don't support the project or anything like that. Well, I'm just saying is that it's probably best mm -hmm. to put all the great success that Amazon has done for local communities, which I know exists, uh, and you put it in a presentation format. For example, drones. We all know that uh, Amazon can't open up tomorrow and, and make drones uh, in put them in the air. They'll have to get do have will have to go through a variance process and city approval process. Um, so it's um, it's just my recommendation that, and as my motion, that we table this to the next upcoming uh, planning commission meeting if city staff could handle it. City staff, can you handle this at the next planning commission meeting? Not at the next planning commission meeting. It would have to be the... the um, we had several, um, several, I guess, applicants that that were willing to move their their um, items to the next okay. planning commission meeting. So, what date? Yeah. W uh, what date would that be? If so, 
So, let's see. Chair Becerra. So it'll be the second, it'll be like, what is that, August, uh, October, this, this, the last uh, week before the last, uh, October 19 or 12? May I comment before the motion goes further, sir? He gets a just from this rebuttal. I think just from the standpoint, yeah, yeah, from the standpoint that there are escrow obligations right now occurring, and a continuance to what you're asking for will seriously damage the ability for this project to go forward. I'm telling the absolute truth. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear because people are speaking. What, what was that last comment? I'm saying that since we've gone through this for almost two years, there are escrow deadlines uh, arriving very quickly with the seller. And it was absolutely vital that we get to this hearing tonight. That was impressed upon the need through staff and the city management, why they moved other items off this agenda to get us on here. If we have to go into a continuance most likely this project may be seriously damaged and or may die. And I, as such, I would greatly appreciate at least the opportunity tonight to respond to some of these comments so that I can at least provide some greater comfort. And I do respect Commissioner Gutierrez's request very much so. And if we had an abundance of time in this escrow process, I have no problem with that. But I've been instructed tonight that we, unless you see any other time frame. So escrow has not closed? We are within weeks of the close of escrow deadline. And if you're talking a continuance such as this, um, you may lose your Amazon completely. If that's the intent of the community that's present, that may be their purpose, it's not ours. And we think it's a very good project for the city. And I'm not trying to put any undue pressure on you, sir. I apologize. Just, we're not I, also been constrained. deciding. We, yeah, well, I was sure it's just a recommendation, but um, let's just say if you were to put this in a PowerPoint presentation, how, many, how, how long would it take you, a day or two? Or? Um, this is just, it's just out thinking out loud. I, my, my next question will be that if if it was possible, is it, is it possible to maybe do like a, if we were to give them a, cu a couple, or maybe until this week to, when is your escrow deadline? Next week or the week after? Okay, so my, my, my dot out loud is that if we were to, let's just say, give you this remaining week to do some outreach and put this presentation together, and if, if the chair uh, was okay, maybe we, could call, maybe we could call for like a special meeting for this item and then, and then hear it at, at a special meeting and so forth. Is he gonna need anything additional to, what he's doing right now is his rebuttal just to the concerns of yeah. the residents. So I don't know that he needs a PowerPoint for that. And, and it's not, please don't consider me to be rebutting and arguing. I just would hope to clarify some of the statements made for you to make a better decision having both sides to these opinions. And I respect you greatly for your comments, but. So I'll recall my motion and so you could go ahead and, and, and re rebuff. And and I will stay here as late as you would like. Uh, that's how important this is. This is very, very important to us. We had hoped to be at a hearing here in June, and we're now in September, and this is uh, at a drastic point in time. We, we just need to go. Okay, so with that. Please, let him speak. Thank so you. I, I will try to be as brief as possible. So, speaker number one, again, I'll just go through the 12. Uh, Mr. Martinez. Um, he talked about union jobs and the like. I need to emphasize, this is a land use process. Considerations proposal of a land use of converting the property to industrial and an industrial user. I haven't any control, nor does the developer, nor does the city to control wages, benefits or anything regarding labor within this facility. And, and as great as I understand, it would be nice to have everybody paid a living wage or greater. 
it's not within our jurisdiction, nor is it within the Planning Commission or the City Council when it comes to land use decisions. This is a land use process. So I don't disagree with what anyone is saying in the audience about labor. I mean, I, I grew up working in fast foods. Back in my day, I'm so old, it was $1.60 an hour. So, yes, I agree. It's not high pay, but from a standpoint of view, I don't even think your city attorney would agree that you can condition a project based on wages or benefits or anything else. I could be wrong, but in a land use hearing such as this, your role as a commission to recommend to the council is based on the appropriateness of the land use. Is the land use compatible with the community? Does it benefit the community? Uh, so that was my comment to the speaker number one, Mr. Martinez, as brief as I can make it. Commit, com, speaker number two, Michael, did not catch his last name. Um, he made comments about he never heard about the hearing. And again, I mentioned the public hearing notices for the mitigated negative declaration. They went to the homes on the north side of San Bernardino Road. He mentioned about there are four trucks per hour uh, during the daytime. No, it again it was four trucks total during the daytime from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. He mentioned the six driveways on the north side of San Bernardino Road would create hazards with the vans coming out. Again, the vans do not depart until 10 o'clock. Those roads on the south side in the city of Covina are exit and entry points for people who live in the apartments and the residents there. We don't think it's going to create an unsafe condition. That's why these vans have been scheduled to go out in small batches and waves. That's what the city has, a review, has reviewed. The city's transportation department, police department, everybody's looked at this and said, this is the safest way to do this. If there are unsafe conditions out there right now, we're also trying to help. There are people who park on the south side of San Bernardino Road. They run across the street from their apartments. Specifically, one of the requests from the city of Covina was that we put the traffic signal in at Cutter Way to make a safe pedestrian crossing. So people who live on the south side, they may have to go down to the signal, but they have a pedestrian crossing to the north side. So these are positive things that we're trying to do to make this the most compatible and good project for the community. Uh, speaker number three, Sherry Orana, I believe is her name. Um, she again referred to the fact that uh, she is did not know or, or she didn't know we've sent out notices again to everybody within 300 feet around and that's not 20 or 30 people that's in the low hundreds i believe was the list staff has the list of every single person that was mailed public notices um she wanted to know about where the extra van's going to park in the area I, you know I, this site has enough parking should accommodate everything in the future. I, I don't know where some of these questions, where they're coming from, why they're being used against us to damage us. We've never said there would be vans parked off site. We've said it, it's going to all be accommodated on site. That's been the planning and the effort that's gone into this since day one. Um, the, also a comment that Sherry made was that homes uh, would re be reduced in value. There's absolutely no basis for that whatsoever. If vans or trucks create undue noise, I guess there would be a basis for it, but every single study and everything about this design's been made, so it won't create adverse impacts. Traffic won't bother neighbors, and we won't have what is being proposed here. I mean, all these statements are being made out of fear, yet if you read the noise study and you read the traffic studies produced by all of these very qualified people, not me, all of these studies say that there's an insignificant impact on noise and traffic on the neighbors, on the homes in the area. I really took offense, and I would think you would too, when that same speaker said you're the ninth worst city in the state of California. I didn't think it was very funny. So I don't know who wants to say that you're the ninth worst, but I'll tell you, we think you're one of the best, and we picked your city for that reason, and that's why we're here tonight. If the city doesn't want us, I doubt that very much. Maybe people in the audience are, but again, 13 people spoke, and you have almost 100,000 people in your city. So I think there are a lot of people out there that probably do support us, and they're not here because they are comfortable with what we're doing. Your fourth speaker, uh, Brandy Davis, I believe, she just made comments about the cars are accelerating and faster and cut her way. 
uh, again, we're putting a traffic signal at Cutter and San Bernardino Road exactly as the city of Covina had asked because they have concerns about the danger of that intersection, cars going northbound on Cutter and Covina and making a left turn on the San Bernardino Road. So we're accommodating them to make that intersection, which is not signalized currently, to make it signalized. Bill Robinson uh, was speaker number five. He kept saying the CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act documents are all very un inaccurate, that uh, there are impacts on homes, um, it's not legal under CEQA, it needs an EIR and so forth. The process is very specific under the law and this has been fully followed by your city and your staff. You start off with what's called an initial study. Somebody referred to the checklist. The checklist is reviewed by the staff and the consultants. And the checklist says, out of those 20 categories, is there going to be a potential impact on noise and air and so forth? From there, technical studies are prepared. So the technical studies that were pre prepared for this document were the traffic, air quality, noise, um, sewer, and other things. And those technical studies all came back and said there are not any significant adverse impacts. There may be minor impacts. Minor are insignificant under the law traditionally acceptable with any new development, and don't over-impact any sewer system or streets and so forth. Every one of these documents, then the city decided that a mitigated negative declaration is warranted. A mitigated negative declaration means an EIR is not warranted. This project does not warrant having an EIR prepared. An environmental impact report is only prepared when there are potentially significant adverse impacts. This entire process has not identified a single potentially adverse environmental impact. It is so well designed and so well mitigated, it does not have impacts. And I, I feel sorry that many people are making these accusations that are unfounded without reading everything, but that is the fact. They're in all the documents. They've been available online for more than a month and a half, and people have the right to comment on them. And what, we had five letters on the review of those documents? And tonight we have 12 people. That's not a lot, in my opinion. Speaker number six. Cheryl, the manager of Lake El uh, Lark Ellen Apartments. I forgot her last name. I apologize. She said they were not notified. They were not um, involved in this process. And then she turned right around and said she participated in the online meeting. She did. She was one of the participants. We thought we had some communication going with them. We thought things were moving along fairly well. We even had two residents in Lark Ellen approach us and want to know information about jobs at Amazon, who they could contact because they loved the idea of coming next door. So notices went out to all of the residents in the Lark Ellen within 300 feet. That's all we got. And until today, or yesterday, when an attorney appeared that has dropped this letter on all of us saying all these things are inaccurate and wrong, we didn't think there was anything wrong. Nor did city staff. Nor did the consultants. So we are, though, more than happy to work with that attorney, and we will try to resolve things to a great degree. But these are things that we can easily do between now and the city council. You are the recommending body. All we are asking for tonight is you look at this project as a land use project and that you recommend to the city council that they vote on this and an approval. At the city council meeting, we will then finalize whatever agreement we need to make with Lark Ellen Apartments next door, and the city council will make a final decision, as the law says, on a changing the general plan, on changing the zoning, on approving the precise plan, approving the parcel map, and the development agreement. And we spent a lot of time on that. That development agreement is worth $4 million to the city of West Covina. $4 million. That's more than 10% of your annual budget. And we're being told out here by some people, oh, that won't even cover the cost of asphalting a road. Well, I can tell you, I have never seen any city out there receive $4 million, even close to that, on an Amazon project or any other project I've ever worked on. Before this, the most any city wanted, asked for, and we gave was $350,000 of the city of Cyprus in Orange County. And you are $4 million. That is a huge committee benefit. And we feel that that takes serious uh, looking at from the standpoint that 
Yes, financially, your city needs some assistance, but you're not the worst city. You're not the ninth worst in the state, and this will help, and that's what we're hoping to do and make your city give, you know, some assistance. Speaker number seven, Dean Richard, he said he was concerned about the traffic and the fact there was no upward mobility. Um, sorry, he referred to the traffic as being hostile to children and, and the like. Well, you know, the traffic, as I stated before, Amazon already exists. Amazon delivers in your city. The delivery vans are throughout your city, and we've heard that from people in the audience. They're here. Whether they're dispatched from this building or elsewhere, they're on your city streets, and whether they stop inside Lark Ellen and ask Cheryl if they can use her restroom or not, not my concern, but yes, there will be restrooms on this project for delivery van drivers to access. They can go in the building. But the fact is that these are people in the city that are Amazon clients or members, and probably many of you order online, but there are a whole lot of businesses in this city who buy their supplies through Amazon. So the comment that this will, will shut down the mall, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, if the mall was going to be shut down, that would have happened a long time ago. Amazon had its peak sales time during the COVID shutdown. You know, the, the purchases are going down right now. They are an additional service and a benefit to your community. This is not meant to shut anyone down. That was the argument years ago made by Walmart, that Walmart would shut everybody else down. Amazon's not here to do that. Amazon's here to serve you. It, you're... Your constituents, your hundred and some thousand population in the city, they're the ones served by Amazon. They're the customer, and that's who's going to benefit here. Amazon wants to be a good member of your community. That's why they're here reaching out. And yes, I do represent Amazon. I'm not an employee, but I'm an authorized representative, and that's why I'm here speaking. I've spoken at many other city council meetings on behalf of Amazon. Not everything that Amazon does do I know. There are pri proprietary sides of businesses I can't talk about because, quite frankly, I don't know all the benefits the employees make. I'm a land use specialist, a specialist in environmental law. You know, I'm, I testify in court and the like. And I do economic development for cities. I don't know the level of benefits that these employees get. $15 an hour to me, at least for a new job, is better than probably what's paid down the street at McDonald's or Del Taco or any other fast food. And in the state of California, the minimum wage is going up in two more years, I believe. The Teamsters will know, what is it, $22 an hour? So when the state rate goes up, this will too. But I, that is not my concern, nor it should be yours. This is a land use decision. And I'm sorry to say that, but this business should not be judged on the salaries it's going to pay and the benefits it's going to pay. The, uh, uh, speaker number seven, Dean Richard, I'm sorry, he was talking about the speaker number eight. There's just a few more. Tobias, um, he was the gentleman who lives in Lark, Lark Ellen Apartments. Um, he spoke about the $15 hours. Uh, he referred to the fact that, hey, spend some of this money on fixing sidewalks and the like. There are conditions of approval in here on this project say every broken and cracked sidewalk in front of Amazon on San Bernardino Road in Badillo has to be ripped out and replaced. So Amazon has to fix all the sidewalks up and down both sides of the street. We'll make it better than for pedestrians. I don't know what he's referring to about all the sidewalks being broken in the area. Um, he is, says he's concerned about noise. Yeah, I, again, when all the experts say it's not going to have an impact, I don't know what more I can tell you. I, I can go back and in two weeks come back with another presentation. I can tell you I'm going to be saying the same thing. That's what exists in all these documents. Uh, Lisa, let's see, spoke, spoke. Uh, Lisa, our, our attorney for Lark Ellen next door, she mentioned about the different operating uh, conditions she would like. Some are reasonable, some are very unreasonable, but we've had those conversations and we're still going to have them. But those operating conditions are not needed for land use approval tonight. They are specific to what Lark Ellen would like in relationship to them. You don't need to put them in tonight. If they're absolutely needed, the city council can put them in as conditions, but at what point does it stop on a land use basis that we have conditions that already reflect the business? Because a business project description that you see, or a land use description that you see, is the project. So when you approve a business, this one or any other, you don't have to write conditions that say potentially 
all the things in the world that it shouldn't do in the future or it can't do. Reasonable conditions are the ones that have some obvious need for changing the impact. But there are so many mitigation measures and conditions in this project already. We've reached the point where, you know, what, what innovation or motivation is them for this business to ever grow? Uh, gent number 10, I couldn't catch his name out there. Um, he was commenting about the, the cost of streets again and the benefits. Again, the signal on Cutter Way, uh, you know, fully being fully funded by Green Law Partners on behalf of Amazon. The city of Covina is not paying for it. The entire city, uh, San Bernardino Road is in the city of Covina. So the front sidewalk on San Bernardino Road and across the street is Covina. It's not in your city. You don't have jurisdiction over that street. However, because this project has the traffic alignments that are in question with Covina. That's why we've worked with that city. They worked with staff and we've all come up with the solutions on the driveway locations and the traffic signal. They don't seem to be overly concerned. We're still going to meet with Covina on any necessary repairs to their street. But Amazon Green Law Partners has to get permits from the city of Covina for cutting and moving driveways and cleaning up the alignment with Cutter, for example. So all of that will work out and that's all to the city's benefit. Uh, gentleman number 11 who spoke, um, he just he referred to some of the streets by Lark Ellen. Oh, he was talking about the illegal truck traffic driving on Lark Ellen. As I understand, the street of Lark Ellen that passes from San Bernardino Road to Badillo is not in your city. Your city boundary line ends again at the edge of that street as it does with San Bernardino Road. But regardless, any, any truck that is the commercial rating over the 12,000 pounds has to stay on a designated truck route. If not, and as Christine said in the next comments, they cut down another street. You know, you could condition this project, but a driver is going to do what they want to do. That's why the West Covina Police Department writes tickets. And it's a traffic enforcement issue. So if a truck comes off of the 10 freeway at Vincent versus Azusa and comes north, you better believe they're going to end up with a ticket. That's what the police department's in for. Your traffic enforcement division is in charge of catching any truck that's not on a truck route. So if they're trying to cut through somewhere, then the responsible thing to do is let the police department know that this is occurring so that traffic division can send a motor officer out there, usually a motorbike officer, and write the tickets. And the last one was Christine, um, lives on the second street south of Badillo. A bit, um, she referred to Azusa Street being congested already. It's dangerous. Uh, she talked about children crossing to school and various other streets. Again, the, the delivery trucks are nighttime primarily. There's only one an hour that would be using Azusa, so it wouldn't affect anything there. Uh, the delivery vans disperse out. They're random. They come back at various times. You have traffic on the street now. You're going to have more. San Bernardino Road is a regional truck route. Regardless of what happens here, you're going to have more trucks passing through. That's what a truck route is. Each city measures intersections every year, and they have what's called a safe route to schools. So wherever you have an elementary school, there is a designated by state law safe routes to schools where the police department has paths that are designated for crosswalks, that's where they put crossing guards. So when you see crossing guards near a school, that's a safe, designated safe route to school. So if there's an unsafe situation, the city needs to know about it so the police department's traffic division can ensure that there are always safe routes to cross in Azusa or a Vincent or any other street. And I don't disagree with her concerns, but if she's that concerned, hey, that's not Amazon. She ought to be calling the, the police department right now and discussing that and trying to let them know, because many times, and I know, police departments don't know everything that the residents know out there. So there is some obligation to let them have the first chance to make those changes. So again, I'm sorry that I took more of your time. 12 people, I'm sorry, 13 people spoke. Sorry, 12. 11 opposed, one was in favor. I respect the 11. In a project this size, I don't see any overwhelming opposition. I think this is an excellent project. 
And I'm not just saying that because it's me and I represent this owner. We have tried very hard. We've spent two years. Of course, the people haven't seen it for two years. It takes a year and a half to go through various site plan designs and engineering studies and capacity to decide what can work here. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on designing this project to get it here tonight. And again, I greatly respect you, Commissioner Gutierrez, asking for more time. But I, I am saying with my hand raised, I absolutely mean it. I'm not fabricating this as I've been accused of in the audience. The escrow is right down near the end. This property owner, the seller of the church would be seriously damaged. This buyer would be seriously damaged. If we don't meet the escrow commitments, and I was instructed before I came in to here tonight, we need a recommendation out of you. And I am sorry to put it that way, but we strongly request that you please help us and support us. If there's something you feel is maybe not completely closed up or you're a little uncomfortable about, we'll address it at City Council. But please, we've got to get to the City Council by October 19th. That's the date we've been shooting for that City Management's trying to make happen for us. And if we can't make it, I, you know, I'm done. I'm, I'll be out of this. So thank you very much. And I apologize. Thank I'm still here to answer questions if you wish, but like I don't know what else I can the say. Attorney, what is the radius that they, the minimum they have to notify residents? Minimum's 300. Okay. You know, I, I shop at Amazon just like probably everybody in this room, but I just, I do believe in supporting local businesses. I actually know the facility very well because my children went to Jubilee Christian there and I was very involved. There's over 10,000, they had over 10,000 attendees weekly. That's why we had to hire the police officers to direct traffic. Not only that, they did not just have preschool, they had nursery, they had preschool, and they also had kindergarten through eighth grade there, plus their weekly meetings for 12 step, counselors, Turning Point Ministries does their counseling out of there. So I, I am very familiar with it. And it does have a lot of traffic as a church. That being said, um, Mr. Gutierrez, um, Commissioner Gutierrez made mention of a motion for to table, but I do not want to delay uh, their meeting to the city council. So is there another date before, prior to that? that we can meet, a special meeting. Madam Chair, um, if you would like to, if the commissioners would like to continue the item, we could continue it to a special planning commission meeting. Um, if uh, October 4th works for you. Is that a Monday? That is the upcoming Monday, yes. That is, that's fine with me. Yeah. Commissioner Gutierrez. Okay, I'd like to make a motion uh, to table this until Monday, October 4th for a special meeting um, uh, to be held here in the council chambers at, um, Madam Chair, do you have a preferred time? 7.30, I think, or what do you prefer? You guys have a preferred time? Um, I'll be flying back from out of state. Okay. And so I would prefer that it be either at 7 o'clock. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, are you guys fine with 7 o'clock? Okay, I'll make the motion to table this until October 4th for 7 p.m. here in Council Chambers. Commissioner Gutierrez, is it to table or to continue? I'm oh, sorry, to continue it to October 4th at 7 p.m. in Council Chambers in the city of West Covina. I believe we need a second. Mr. Lamb, is that a, a time available for you to come back? October 4th, 7 p.m.? Chair, Bas Chair Becerra, uh, yes, we'll be back. It would certainly help me this moment what you expect of us for that meeting. I think uh, once again, it's a great project. I think just uh, put some of these questions in, in, in the presentation. Put some of the stuff that you could find on Amazon's website on the presentation and let's get it documented and let's uh, 
get the facts out of the opportunities that are out there for our residents. And uh, yeah. So at this time we're going to close the public hearing. Paulina, um, do you want to take? Oh, no, we do have a second motion. I need a se we need a second on that. You have a second. I'll second it. Okay. Um, so we have a motion by Gutierrez to continue the item to a special planning commission meeting on October 4th, 7 p.m. here at the council chambers. Uh, Commissioner Williams? Aye. Commissioner Gutierrez? Aye. Commissioner Hang? Vice Chair Lewis? Nope. Uh, Chair Becerra? No. Okay, I think motion passes 3-2. Can we take five, please? I need to All right, so you're good? Okay. What were you saying? I couldn't hear you. Five. Is that the next one? Or are we, are we going to? Finish them off tonight. Can't hear you. There's others, isn't there? Right. Uh, Paulina, we have another staff report. Yes, we do, Madam Chair. Um, Joanne Burns, our planning manager, will present the staff report. Thank you. We are still conducting business. Thank you. Madam Chair, I apologize. The monitor went up, so we have to bring it back down if you give us a minute or two. Sure. Mr. Lamb needs security out there. This is the R R1 RA code standards that was initial that was brought back from the planning commission meeting 
of October 24, 2021. At that time, the Planning Commission, the uh, staff presented the Planning Commission with pro with proposed changes to the to the city's municipal code pertaining to the R1 RA standards, and staff received some direction from the Planning Commission. And that the direction from the Planning Commission reflects the changes to the draft the reflects the draft ordinance presented. The, this language, um, this revised language on the projector will, will revise a code where garages will no longer be counted toward the, the maximum unit size to be consistent with industry, industry standards. Staff added recreation room to the list of non-habitable accessory buildings or structures that are allowed in the code. Recreation rooms, if a property, uh, this language um, will clarify that if a property owner is adding 300 square feet to their house, they need to have a two car garage and driveway to fit two vehicles. The draft language on the pro, um, projector clarifies the maximum driveway width. Currently, driveway width is tied to the width of the garage. Uh, it currently there it, uh, in the accessory dwelling unit ordinance, garages are allowed to be converted into an accessory dwelling unit. So, if the garage is converted into an accessory dwelling unit, the current code does um, does not technically allow driveways because it does not lead to a uh, covered parking space. So this code amendment will allow at least a 20 foot maximum with um, driveway on a lot, even if it doesn't have a garage on the property. The code change on the project on up on the projector, the intent of it is to reduce the side and rear setback requirements for non habitable structures to four feet. This was discussed in the last city um, planning commission meeting. Wait, Joanne, can you go back to the other one first? Thank you. The Section 20, the changes proposed for Section 26-406. Um, it's just a reformat of the current section with co cross-referencing to the special requirements for yard and setback section. The proposed language allows for increased height of detached garages and storage sheds within required rear yard to 20, an increase to 20 feet with a director's review and a determination, determination that the design is compatible with other structures on the property and is at least 15 feet from any permitted structure and, and or swimming pool on the neighboring property. This also reformatted this section and cross-referenced the special requirements for garden setback section. There are also other changes that were minor and also involved cross-referencing certain sections so that one who was reading the code can easily identify the areas that would be applicable and so that nothing is lost in translation. Also, um, sections identifying insignificant dates were deleted. Um, to name a few, there are certain sections in the code that references a date um, for, for legal non-conforming structures. Um, in the city's eyes, all existing structures constructed with permits are considered legal non-conforming if it does not comply with other, with current code standards, no matter when it was constructed. So if it was constructed 
um, last week and the code changes um, and it was constructed with permits, it would, it would be called, considered legal nonconforming and the city is not gonna require property owners to remove legal nonconforming um, situations or structures on the property. With this, staff is recommending the Planning Commission approve resolution number 21-6100, recommending that the City Council adopt the attached ordinance. Um, Joanne, can you repeat the 300 square foot? I saw it somewhere, but I just don't see it here anymore. Uh, where was that? It's section, it's the th uh, second section down from the discussion. Where it says 26-402 A, B, and C, off street parking and garage requirement. So is it this section up on the projector or up on? I'm not clear with this particular one. Is it because, wait, we, we probably talk about this one. Is that the one that Let's say if someone want to add an additional 300 square foot or so, then they have to have a four? It, the current code requires every single um, family residential property on, in the city um, have a two car garage plus two uncovered parking spaces. So what's happening right now is the existing garage is converted into, at times converted into ADUs. So if if a garage is converted into an ADU, then they would no longer have that two covered parking spaces. So this would, this code section would basically say that if they were going to add um, more than 300 square feet to their existing house, then they would have to have a two car garage. Is this, um, I'm just, I guess I'm concerned. Are we trying to encourage the development of housing? Are we trying to limit? Because by if they were to convert their garage to an ADU, now that if they were to they want to do an enlargement to the main house, they're being locked in the fact that they have to provide garage. And So as a city, are we trying to encourage development of housing or are we trying to prevent more development? I'm just. Um, okay, so this, the city is trying to retain because, wait, hold on, as much wait. local control as we can pertaining to ADUs. I'm just going to throw in my two cents on this. I don't really see this as, as something that is a, a particularly um, pro or against development. I think this is really just a, cons a, a consideration that should rightfully be in place due to the fact that uh, when you have someone develop a, a garage into an ADU, it takes mm -hmm. away parking and then will necessarily have an impact on our streets. The, to the extent that we don't have the ability to require additional parking when an ADU or a junior ADU is put into place, this is basically the only Next best. prophylactic means that we have to put in place. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's really what this is. I don't think that this is something that is pro or anti-development. I think this is a neutral thing that specifically deals with parking considerations that the state legislature doesn't care about. So we're improving parking? We're creating, uh, uh, we're creating off street parking specifically for residential properties. And this is one of the ways of creating that. So we're going to make, so technically we're making sure that there's parking spots, right? Because no, right that's now it's, not, I, I, I think it's kind of like a mess. We're, we're not making sure because we can't <laughs> make sure. Yeah. And, I, and I, I think that that's, that may be the, the, the thing that's that's lost on everyone here is that the the 
ADU process is by right. And so right. if someone converts their garage, guess what? You can't we have ask. nothing to say about that. We can't require Correct. additional off-street parking. We can't do anything. But really, all this comes down to is in the event that someone decides that they want to improve their house or do a, a, a remodel in which they add on an additional 300 square feet, they're going to be required to put back what was lost effectively by putting in an accessory dwelling unit, which took away the, uh, the, the garage at that point in time. Oh. Again, it's sort of a limited scope thing because we're unfortunately at a disadvantage because again, state legislature has passed a law that they really don't consider the downstream consequences of not, not having parking requirements. That's really what this comes down to. There's, there's nothing really all that complicated about it other than we're basically in the situation where we have to effectively play catch up uh, based upon the limitations that, 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 are, that are put into place with us such that you know, there's, there's less parking. I mean, for example, Walnut Creek Parkway is a street that already has a major parking problem in our city, okay? Particularly between Azusa and Hollenbeck. And I'll tell you, if, if we saw a situation where people were converting their one car garages or, 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 or two car garages, which are, um, which are one, one car wide into accessory dwelling units, on top of these houses, which are not on particularly large lots, you're going to have an even bigger parking problem there than you already do because there, there's no place to park. And so, in effect, if we if somebody says, okay, I'm gonna add 300 square feet to that particular property, at that point in time, we're gonna say, no, 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 you're not gonna do that unless I get it now. you put back in a, uh, a, a garage. But by that point, it is not possible anymore, especially in the area where you mentioned. It is, those slots are very, very small, very, very tight, and they barely can fit a garage in a house. By the time that they converted their garage, and if they don't have a foresight to see that in the future, if I'm gonna add an additional 300 square foot or so, then you're, they're lacking of being not, we're preventing the homeowners not being able to develop or create more livable space. So I guess a better, a better um, I, 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 I do acknowledge, I do acknowledge the fact that we do have a parking issue, but there must be a better way in terms of planning purpose for the city of West Comina and for the resident. How can we have both encouraged I think for the residents to actually have the ability to keep the garage, but also develop the ADU that's required by state. I think so these are something that these are something that we need to we can't just find ways to block every way. We need to be able to think a little bit further ahead of time and say, hey look, what can we come up with and come up with some creative ideas how we can help our resident to be able to get their car off the street and also allowing them. So because we're limiting Keep well, limiting the staff is very difficult. Well, I, th I think also... I mean, keep limiting the residents to be able to produce whether these little ADUs or whether these um, expansions or enlargement or addition, that's what the majority of what residents anywhere can do. They can, if they can run off and build a brand new house, they would, trust me. But the fact is, land is very expensive, development home is very expensive, and that's why we're adding these little units. Do I agree we should add these little units? I don't know. I, I personally don't need it, but there are a lot of people that need these little units. Yeah. So as a city and as planning commissions that we're in charge of planning for the future of our city, we should all get together and have a, have a, have a discussion how we can help residents to have these little ADUs and to have a garage and to be able to expand the rightful way. Instead of finding ways to keep blocking and blocking, next thing you know, the state is coming down without vote. Well, the every little law that comes the state, in. The state has already taken it out of our hands. That's because that's, we that's have not, not, so not going to change. Maybe because of state already. law, is there a way to somehow put language like this? Shouldn't that be kind of like in like fire code amendment thing? Because, uh, for example, in District 1, uh, there's a lot of apartments that have uh, a, a 
a what's it called a, a garage with a, with a door and some of those people want to convert those into adus which they could but they're allowing cars to pile up and block entrances and exits exits to apartments which endangers the lives of the residents who live in those apartments but so my question is is should it be a code amendment change like that or should it be more of a fire fire code ish a fire code I think there's a catch-22 with this law and this ADU requirements, and I think as a city and as a planner, all five of us can come up with some type of ideas to help our residents instead of finding different ways to block it. For one, for one, for example, the height of our ADU is 15. So if they, if someone wants to build a garage on the bottom and build a unit on top, they cannot do that. So in a way, we're not. This is state law. The, fifth, the 16 feet is state law. But as a, as a city, can we come up with something creative that, hey, look, if you gave us two-car garage or three-car garage, whatever garage that we want or come up with, then maybe perhaps we can give the heights increase. That's the only way that we can actually have the garages in a certain area of our city that really needs the garage to park their car. If you allowed them to park uh, or build on top of the garage, all they would do is have two ADUs, one on top and one on bottom. <laughs> well, we can have a covenant. The city can have a covenant saying that the garage needs to be garage. They have the ADU already. As it, that, as is, that is... Yeah, can, I, can I just interject? Is there any way we can get to the public hearing and open and close that, and then if you guys want to continue this debate on things that do not seem we to don't be have in line with, uh, with what this code amendment procedure is in line with, go right ahead. Quite a full house for open house right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no, no... Okay, open hearing. <laughs> Yeah, I guess you can close, close. close the hearing. Yes. Okay, so do we have a motion. Do you want to continue? I'm, I'm on a motion to approve, uh, give me one second, I apologize, the uh, uh, code amendment number uh, 20-04 um, as presented. I'll second it. I actually like to make a motion to continue this and have a better discussions of how we can handle our cities um, ADU situations and parking situations. Come up with some tough, we'll have a discussion. Russ, I believe we have a motion, a second, so we vote on that motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, Commissioner Williams? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Gutierrez? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Hing? Commissioner Hing? Oh, I'm sorry. It was a motion to approve code amendment number 20-4, uh, resolution 21-61. Uh, There's a... Her mo oh, no. Was there a second to Commissioner Hang's motion? Who seconded it? I... Is there a second to Commissioner Hing's motion to continue the item? Is there a second for that motion? Okay. Looks like. Okay. So. So we'll uh, continue, yes, we'll move on the motion uh, made by Lewis, seconded by Gutierrez to approve code amendment number, um, approve recommendation um, of resolution 216100. Commissioner uh, Williams. Aye. Commissioner Gutierrez. Aye. Commissioner Hang. Uh, Vice Chair Lewis. Aye. And Chair Becerra. Aye. Motion passes 4-1. Uh, 
the final action on this matter will be taken at a public hearing before the City Council on the date to be determined. So number five, non-hearing items. I would like to amend my appointment to Commissioner Brian Gutierrez. Commissioner Gutierrez had expressed an interest on the subcommittee and, and been able to confirm his availability to be a member. As such, I would like to appoint Commissioner Gutierrez and myself as the subcommittee, or to the subcommittee. Would any of the commissioners like to, oh, I'm sorry, commission reports, comments, and miscellaneous? Uh, would any of the commissioners like to report or comment on an item? Community Development Director's Report. Uh, Pauline, are there any items to report to the commission? Um, yes, Madam Chair. Um, the City of West Covina will be holding its State of the City and Employee Recognition Dinner on October 14th at the Sportsplex. Tickets are now on sale. Um, you are all invited to attend. Um, the community at large as well is invited to attend. Uh, this Saturday, we also have a career resource fair at the Senior Center with Assembly Member um, Rubio um, from, uh, I believe, 9 to 2. And then we have a open house at Fire Station 2 um, from 10 to 2 as well. Um, and everyone's welcome to attend both events. Paulina, I'd like to amend on item number 3. I'm sorry, just the action is final unless appealed within 10 days to the City Council. Okay. That's it. Oh, Is sorry. So, City no Council actions. Um, the City Council did introduce the first reading of the code amendment and zone change for the um, overlay zone on the uh, at the uh, September 21st City Council meeting. Um, and then the second hearing will be on um, the next, uh, the October 5th city council meeting. Since there's no further business consider, this meeting is adjourned at 10.56 p.m. Good night.